uh, Wardock, Ernestina Giudici, hello. We have the incoming team of the uh, US International Humanistic Management Association, President PJ Dillon. You want to um, wave? <laughs> Great. Uh, and we have Jennifer Hancock. Yes, thank you. And Ariane Saini. Thank you. And Ernestina Giudici is the is the the leader in the Italian space. I'm wondering if, if we have people from the Mexican space, the, the Latin American space. I think they have a concurrent meeting today. Uh, and then we may have folks from from oh Manuel Guillen, I just see you wanna you wanna say hello, unmute so that people can see you from the Spanish yeah. group. Great to see you all. Especially, you. well, all the well-known friends, Sandra Donna. <laughs> Great to see you all, Jennifer. <laughs> Michael, thank you for the invitation. This is awesome. Great, and it's the benefit of the online format <laughs> that we can all join from different places. So, um, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm going to leave the space open, maybe just for Jim, for Erica, for PJ, for Jennifer, for Ariane, for Anastina, for all of you to just share what you feel is important for us to get going. Um, the main intention of today is really to spark a conversation. So Jim and uh, Donna and Jeffrey and uh, Bob will share briefly, but then we want to have a conversation first between among, amongst them, but also between you. So I, I want you to just consider your questions, put them in the chat possibly, but also be ready to just engage directly. Um, and for that, it would be fantastic if you can turn your camera on. Uh, so thank you all. Erica, Michael, you want to chime we, in or Jennifer? Yeah, can mm -hmm. we start with some information about IMA? So, you know, if people yeah. aren't familiar, we can give them kind of an update on who we are and what's going on and where to get information. So, um, so PJ, you do you... Before we do that, just on behalf of the, uh, the lead, some of the leadership team that's turning over, so that would be David Wasilewski, who's our outgoing president, and myself as outgoing vice president. We welcome everyone. Thank you so much for being here. And with that, I'd love to turn it over to PJ, our new president, and Jennifer, our new vice president. Great. Thanks, Erica. I'm so excited to be here today and to be with this group of people. I think EMA has just been such a wonderful opportunity to expand um, our knowledge and our focus into, you know, humanistic management and dignity and well-being and flourishing. So thank you all for joining and being a part of this conversation and being a part of this space. And I really want to point out how um, how fortunate we are too to have such a great board of directors for the US chapter. So in our US chapter, we have myself as the uh, incoming president, Jennifer Hancock um, as the incoming vice president. And we also have Ariane Saini as the managing director and Elizabeth Castillo as our secretary. And we have other board members as well who join and bring their expertise such as Gerard, I think it's Farias or Farias, Gerard. So we all, Gerard's here today, I know, um, and Akil, uh, Tiramizi, um, and Jyoti Batani. Um, so we have such a great group of people. And one of the things I would love for you all to think about today as we're going through, you know, what are some areas that you would want to contribute to, would want to get involved in? And there are lots of different ways for you to do that to help kind of move this discussion forward, especially around, you know, implementing it. How do we implement this within our education, you know, within our pedagogy, within our practice, even practice within the classroom, right? How do we practice being humanistic um, professors and teachers, right? What does that look like? So there's a lot of different ways too that you can get involved. So I really welcome everybody here today. Um, and Jen, I don't know if you want to say a couple of words as well about how to get involved. Sure. So for me, um, IMA has been kind of a brain saver for me over the last few years. The friendships I've developed through volunteering, the relationships, um, the sense of optimism that positive things are indeed happening, despite what all seems to be going on in the world. It's just been 
a wonderful thing to keep me going and being optimistic. And then again, the friendships and the relationships that I've developed through the volunteer work have just, they mean the world to me. So I do encourage you to download the link we gave you to the PDF. It gives you some information on what all we have going on, the national, the international, the different projects, the resources we've developed um, for teachers and other things, the books that have been published. There's quite a lot that has been accomplished over the years. So I encourage you to download that. And then if you have questions or are interested in getting more involved or learning more about any of the projects, just to to lurk, let us know. Wonderful. Any other prior comments before we officially get started with our panel in a minute? We have more time for conversation in the break and we will have time and breakout rooms in the break uh, to invite you to just informally connect as well. And then we have a workshop coming up after that that will be co-led by Michael Gelb, who will join at 11.30. So, and I just discovered Raj Sisodia in one of the tiles. Thank you, Raj, for being here, because I think in many ways you made some of those connections. <laughs> Raj, uh, Bob, and Michael, somehow they're, they're all a team. Uh, and so thank you for being here with us as well, and feel free to contribute. Sure, my pleasure. Anything you do and anything that has Sandra and Bob and all the other great people I see on my screen. I'm, I'm happy to be part of. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you all. So, um, Erica, a final word or? I, no final words other than, again, so pleased to, to kick Academy pre-conference off with everyone. And we certainly have many sessions at Academy as well. Um, starting Friday morning, we have some PDWs around uh, transformation, bringing the manager back in and how we actually do the type of research, uh, scholarship and teaching we want to do and how we get it published. There's a great editors panel coming up and others, many other things. We can try to put a link in for that as well. Um, welcome again and uh, I think we can kick off. Thank you. Well, thank you again for, for joining. Welcome. Good morning, everybody. Uh, again, the topic that we're discussing is dignity and the transformative power of that concept for business, business education and business research. And Jim, you have dug into that concept. You have introduced that concept also within an article that I think Sandra would, would agree is, is a sort of a foundation <laughs> for a, an alternative way of, of seeing the kind of work that we are doing in business school specifically. And so maybe you just wanna take it away for five minutes, give us a little bit of an, a, an input on, on what you see is that power and, and where do you see the challenges and the opportunities? Wow, oh, well, thanks. Um, thanks for the nice introduction. And as always, Sandra, thanks for, <laughs> for being you. Um, I feel like I'm nothing without you. <laughs> you keep telling people how great I am. I left on my own devices, I go nowhere. So anyway, thank you. Um, I'm really happy to be here and I'm happy to be on this panel. Um, uh, well, for lots of reasons, but one is as I was thinking about this, um, I, I think about the, uh, for those of you that know me, I just can't let go of this idea that, that a scholar uh, finds the general and the specific. But that's 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 the inclination of a scholar. You know, you, you can read the newspaper and you can say, "Oh, this is good, this is bad," uh, but but when you take the events of the day and then you try to put them in context and history and, and other broader dynamics, that's the the scholarly impulse. Um, uh, some would say that, if, if you will, practitioners are living in the world of the specific. Uh, <laughs> they're getting up every day and they're making news, or they are responding to the news. And so uh, the way you put this panel together is you've got uh, people with scholarly sensibilities, maybe that are, that are drawn to the general, but are yearning for connections to the specific. <laughs> and you just can't, because you can't do it without it. Uh, and then with, um, and I, I don't want to put people in, in boxes, especially people I've never met like Bob and Jeffrey, uh, but these are people of affairs and people of practice who are also deeply reflective uh, and are, they yearn for the general as much as the generalists yearn for the specific. And so this is a classic theory practice kind of conversation, at least in, in my mind. And so I'm, I'm just grateful for that because this is at the essence of who we are and what we all do. Um, that is one. So the second point is 
what I'd like to do is just, well, let me just say, say a word. I'd like to just raise a couple of points and then end with three questions that we can talk about. That's, that's, that's what I'm up to here. Uh, so to go, to go back to um, the scholarly disposition, I find myself in the, at, at a very general level, just you know, wondering about the state of the world. And so for the last, you know, God, who knows, 10 years, I, I've been trying to pay attention to all the concerns about the Anthropocene and uh, what's in store for this, this planet. Um, in recent times, as I try to read outside of our domain, uh, this idea of cascading, um, excuse me, uh, cascading extinction has caught my attention. And right now, 2% of all life forms on the planet are at, at risk of, of uh, saying goodbye. Uh, the estimates are that uh, by 2025, um, it could be, um, no, excuse me, in 25 years, it could be 20 to 25% gone. Uh, and then by the end of this, and then by the end of the century, it could be 50% of all life forms on the planet could go. Now, the, these are quite alarming uh, uh, notions, but I can give you the articles that, from the biologists and the like that, that make that claim. Um, very famously in our world, Nick Bostrom did that survey at Oxford now years ago, and uh, the experts in that room said that uh, the chance of human extinction by the end of the century is 18% probability. So there's that, that, those kinds of notions get my attention. Then you come down a level of abstraction, and I've been fortunate to work with the United Nations this past year, so I'm really marinating in this, but uh, the SDGs are out there. And so that's when you've got um, the particular attention to education and to sanitation and to you know, fill in the blanks uh, with all of the uh, goals and all of the indicators. And then that finds its way to the, to the world of business, both with the Global Compact and with the principles for management education. And I'm... Um, tied in with the, with the latter. Um, so that's also operating on a broad stage, which then you say, well, where's business in all of this? And so in what, where business is, uh, and then there's a question of the distinction between a discrete business and business as the agglomeration of all activity uh, around here, around the planet. Um, business is a source of incredible value and, and, a, and if you will, an incredible good. Uh, you can't get a CAT scan without <laughs> saying thank you to the business enterprise and no one's saying oh, the heck with CAT scans, you know, et cetera. Um, so we, we have that, um, but of course people are uh, quick to point the finger at business when you start looking at the, uh, the nitrogen load in, in our rivers and lakes and streams and the, you know, the suffocation of life in those and in, in underwater. Um, you know, that's agriculture run amok, perhaps. Um, so you so and then, you, you know, you don't want to get in position necessarily of pointing fingers and throwing stones. But we all know that one of the tensions for all of us and why we're all here in this organization is this link between business, to quote David Kuberwriter, as an agent of world benefit and as a source of destruction on the planet. Um, OK, so then you get that's at the macro level. And then things get interesting when you get into a discrete firm where you get into the land of Bob. <laughs> you know, to, he's got a certain number of individuals. He's got to meet payroll. And you're, then you go down into that level and, and what goes on there. Uh, and attentive at the same time to the broader principles that are playing the state of the world and, and, and the like. Um, trying to en encounter that as an organization theory strategy person, of course, I ran into the stakeholder shareholder world and all that. That turned into that project with Tom Donaldson in the paper that uh, Michael so kindly uh, reference and Sandra, uh, but we thought that dignity would be at the center of um, any calculus is to, um, uh, for any decision maker, you do not want to, and then here's where things get tricky. Uh, you want to clear the dignity threshold, which means not to impugn the dignity of any business participant. That should be a minimum criterion as you're doing your work. Uh, it's easy to say, it gets hard to do perhaps in practice. That calls to question a, cu a couple of uh, questions, actually. One is, is dignity a zero one categorical construct or is it continuous? Um, and when you get into this world, it's, you, it's, easy to, well, it's, even, it's easy to say and maybe even easier to operationalize, we are gonna prohibit indignities. Um, and then you say, well, what would that be? And then you have to define dignity. We can say that in a second. And then you just do not want to um, impugn the inherent worth of any, any business participant. Uh, to get into the land of a continuous notion, which is we are going to enhance the dignity of business participants, that's a whole nother story because then it's a question of how high is the sky. 
but intuitively there's the notion of do you want people starving and you give them something to eat or do you want to give them a nourishing <laughs> meal with fruits and vegetables and everything else that's so that's the that's the distinction um but then when you start putting that in practice you get to the how high is the sky issue and that that is a concern for us um one just quick point to put in, in, in on the table before I get to the, the three questions and I will shut up is, um, as I think about this and people that have thought about this have thought about this as well, dignity is a, uh, here's a conceptual term for you. It's a funky term because the origins of it uh, imply inequality, indifference, that it was born of, it's a, it's a character of the nobility. It's a, it's a qual we have the notion of a dignitary and it's something that is earned and it's born of your manners and how you carry yourself and that you are worthy of respect. Uh, so it's something that can be earned, if you will. Um, that has been transmogrified or we've gone back to the original notion is it's the, um, I love the Michael Rosen definition. I wrote this down, an inner transcendental kernel of an estimable value that resides in each one of us. Uh, that's not something that is earned. That is something that you are, if you will, born with. If you're religious, we are created in the image of God and then full stop and you're there. If you're not so religious, you find Immanuel Kant and then you're off and running. You can still find yourself, find your way to the same destination. Um, but uh, I would be alert to slippage. If we get very deeply involved in dignity, pay attention to the earned notion of dignity and when, when this would become contingent in some sense. And it can become contingent. Now we get to the questions. What does this look like in a, in a uh, world of business uh, where you are um, trying to create a quality product at some cost, <laughs> at some cost threshold that can meet market, um, market, market pricing and market dynamics and, and, and assume your viability. Um, it's dignity has a notion of equality, but there's, if you will, all kinds of inequality baked into organizations as they do their work to try to reach for the high quality and the low cost and the market position well enough sustained competitive advantage and to ensure that position. Um, so there's that, that tension that's in play is there's going to be unequal contributions and maybe unequal outcomes. And you're into the, then you're into the land of justice and how, how do you accommodate that? And we'll hear about that. But, but there's, we're not living in a, I used to say, pat the bunny land <laughs> when you read those little books for your kids where everything is beautiful in its own way. <laughs> it's, a, it's a very competitive environment out there. How does that work? That's a, a, a big question. The question that's on my mind also that is capturing my attention these days is, um, when you get into this world, you, you find yourself in the world of corporate governance, at least I, I find myself in the world of corporate governance. And the uh, t-shirt um, definitions when you get in there is it's usually, uh, it's governance and control of the corporation. That, that's for sure, always connected. But then there's governance, accountability and control. And accountability gets thrown in there periodically, but we never pause <laughs> to stop on accountability. And when we, when we start talking about the prohibition of indignities, a question that I think we're gonna to have to grapple with, and I'm trying to play with it myself right now, is um, uh, what's, what is the perpetrator's, if you will, um, responsibility when they, when they have been revealed as a source of indignity in the world? How do we settle up? More to the point, how do we reconcile? And when you start talking about reconciliation, it's not, not so hard to find yourself into a world where you're going, you're going to acknowledge your misdeed or your wrongdoing. And those are two distinct distinctions. You know, mistake and a misbehavior are different. And you're going to acknowledge it. You might apologize. That doesn't work so well in our legal system. <laughs> you start apologizing and you're going to pay for that. But there, what's the nature of the restitution slash reparations? That's in the air these days to account for that wrongdoing. Um, and then what's the nature of atonement and then maybe even punishment that we take in that world. And then on the, per, on the victim side, if you will, um, how do you engage that world where a, a firm maybe has been going through that, where, as you know, um, uh, forgiveness can be weaponized 
And then, then, you don't, then so that you don't want that to happen necessarily. So what does it look like to be on the receiving end of this? What is the nature of forgiveness? Is there room for any mercy with respect to that, that behavior? Uh, and then as a guy that was interested in organizational memory way back when, is there, is there anything with respect to forgetting? <laughs> Can you ever get a clean slate going forward? These are ideas that I haven't really found in the world of organizations uh, and strategy very much. But when we get into the land of dignity, we can be reaching for the zero one to the categorical and how high is the sky and we're going to enhance dignity. But behind it is that notion of impugning dignity. And then how do we settle up after that? Because we may never get the kind of trust that we want in order to build that, if you will, pat the bunny land without some accountability. And so I think that's a question that's um, on the table for us. And with that, I'll just, um, I'll just leave it at that because I, I think I've talked more than five minutes. <clears throat> Thanks for your attention. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Uh, much to, to chew on. And I, I want to invite Donna Hicks to, to share her perspective, because I think she's centering on the unconditional aspect of dignity uh, and how that uh, can be protected and, and, and worked with and how that can be the source of, of quote unquote, peace <laughs> or conflict resolution, right? And so, Donna, do you just want to hop in and share sure. your perspective. Sure, thank you, Michael, uh, and everyone, Erica, and everyone else responsible for this, this opportunity. I, I love these events that Erica and Michael organize and everyone, everyone else. They're always a lot of fun and I meet the most fascinating people. And thank you, Jim, for your, your remarks. I mean, we do have to have that lunch. We definitely do because I have a lot of answers to your question that I have, you know, struggled with myself over the years. But I have to say, one thing about your point um, that, you know, of the general and the specific, my program at Harvard prided ourselves by calling ourselves scholar practitioners. And I can tell you, I would have never, ever achieved the insights that I have achieved um, about dignity without being out there in the world doing my practice. You know, bringing people together who have committed terrible indignities um, against one another. And so that, that idea of, you know, being in both worlds is really familiar to me. And in fact, it's the reason why I went to Harvard to begin with, because I, I, I believed in that notion. And secondly, I want to thank you for reminding us that we have to be mindful of the dignity of the planet. So thank you, thank you, thank you, because I think we all have to be guardians of that, and there's no time like the present to, you know, to really take action on that. Another topic for a lunch or a conversation with all of us. But, you know, I, I wanted to say, as Michael pointed out, I started out in the international world doing, helping people facilitate dialogues, but more Recently, I would say in the last 10 years, I've been also in the corporate world and in the world of business. And let me jump to uh, the pandemic because during the pandemic, I was asked to give webinars, workshops, talks of all kinds all over the world about leading with dignity. What does that look like? What is a dignity honoring organization? How do we create that culture? where everyone feels valued, everyone feels seen, everyone feels heard. And so there, there was an interesting silver lining for me with COVID because, I mean, the demands on, uh, you know, wanting to hear about this, it was, you know, I was busy all of the time and I was happy to be introducing these ideas to the corporate world even more so because I'd done already a lot of work in the corporate world. So what I found is that Dignity is, is important in the workplace, no matter what, no matter what the time or what we're dealing with. But during COVID, it came to the fore, the necessity of dignity came to the fore. And what do I mean by that? Well, what I found, what I discovered is that um, people were hungry for something more positive, something, you know, something that they could do to, to not only enhance the lives of their people, you know, I'm talking about management now, but they were also really interested in creating new opportunities for themselves for, for, for inner growth. And so those two things put together, they wanted to create an environment where people, you know, really felt like 
they mattered and that people, to use Bob's uh, words, cared for them. Um, and so I was just blown away by the number of people who were, and all over, again, all over the world, not just the United States. And so, but, I, and I shared with them certain things that we've learned about dignity that we might not have had even an idea to think about before COVID. And things like, you know, the, the science has shown us, the science of neuroscience and, and behavioral psychology and other, other disciplines have shown us that human beings need connection to survive. And what does that look like in terms of how do we create those connections in the workplace? You know, Jennifer made this lovely comment in the beginning saying one of the things she loved about being on this committee is that she made all these connections with people. And it's no accident that Jennifer said that because we all, I mean, if we are really in touch with that part of our humanity, nothing feels better than a great relationship. And nothing feels better when someone honors our dignity and says that, you know, gives us recognition, accepts us no matter who we are, no matter our race, our religion, treats us fairly, wants to better understand us, seek deeper understand. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about all the 10 elements of dignity that I've laid out in, in both of my books. But, but these, this idea of promoting human connection in the workplace is not only good for the people, not only do they feel their well-being is enhanced, but they also, they also feel um, like the, the work feels better. There's more meaning in my work. So the organization benefits as well as the people inside. And I wish I, we had more time to go into the specifics of what it looks like to honor dignity. I just, not, not I mean, this sounds like a shameless promotion of my books, but I have really operationalized this concept. And if you want to take a look, the first book is Dignity is Essential Role Resolving Conflict and then Leading with Dignity. But um, I think COVID has brought this to the fore like nothing um, ever, ever that we've experienced in the workplace. That need to, to be more sensitive. And I think our leaders have developed, if they follow sort of the dignity conscious you know, path, they've realized that they need different skills and you know, when Michael and others have pointed out that we need to be teaching this in the business community, in the business schools, you know, Jim knows this, everybody standing, we've talked about this, Erica, all of us have, have, have spent so much time trying to create opportunities to teach this, this profound human notion. And you know, I'll just say one last thing that we that I think we need to pay attention to, not only dignity and what it looks like and how to treat people with dignity, but also just recognizing the complexity of the human experience. That's what I learned over during COVID. You know, we're not just these simple human beings that, you know, you give us a paycheck and, you know, maybe a pat on the back every once in a while and we'll perform. No, human beings are far more complex than that. And, and, that complexity, if you understand the role dignity plays in that complexity, about how much we're yearning for that human connection, how much we're yearning to be seen, to be in relationship in a way where both parties feel like their, their dignity is being honored, they're getting mutual recognition, that's our goal. Thank you, Donna. Thank you for sharing that. And I, I would recommend everybody to read uh, the Leading with Dignity book, as well as the Dignity and its uh, essential, also the, the, the first one, I'll say, because uh, it does give you an access to, to how to implement this in businesses or in any organization for that matter. So I think this is actually an organizational problem. It's not a business problem only. You may have dignity violations much more occurring in, in traditional bureaucracies. Um, but uh, that's that's just a, a good start, and I think maybe answers some of what Jim the questions that Jim was raising, or gives a little bit more uh, context to it. I, I'd like to invite uh, now a couple of <laughs> thoughts from from more on the ground, going more specific. And I'm wondering, um, Jeffrey, do you want to go first? I think we had said that you would go at the end, but maybe this is sort of a good tie-in for your work and your role and, and how you see Dignity at Work sort of as a critical piece. 
Um, sure, sure. And um, always happy to follow Donna and be a little bit in her, I was gonna say shadow, but in her, her halo and aura maybe is a, is a better way of saying it. So thank you, Donna, and thank you, Jim, before her, and of course, Michael. Um, it's great to be with everyone. Um, I'm really thrilled about it. Um, yeah, I think it, it is a good um, bridge in a way um, from Donna to, to Bob later. Um, as Michael said earlier, I, I have a background in sort of large corporate environments. I'm a, I'm a lawyer by background. And I think I would say that I'm a beneficiary of what I consider to be uh, kindness and thoughtfulness in the workplace. And, and that is to say that um, after spending a number of years as an in-house lawyer, as a, as a, as a law firm lawyer, um, I joined the in-house legal department at Morgan Stanley where I worked for, for many years. Um, I was a in the closet gay professional and in the mid 2000s, um, despite all the criticism I think that Wall Street gets sometimes well justified, um, they were early adopters of um, inclusion work and um, had employee collectives that gave employees if they chose to, to avail themselves of groups that um, shared identities and um, of course were open to all anyway. Um, and it was a fairly transformative experience for me personally. I, I felt um, seen, I felt listened to and heard, um, which I know resonates with, with Bob. Um, I felt that um, there was someone thinking about what my experience might be like in the experience of others. And it opened up a world of, of colleagues that um, shared challenges that I had and hopes that I had and dreams that I had for what my workplace could be like as a fully formed human being. Um, and that sort of shaped a lot um, for me how I began to think of something that I didn't really label as dignity at the time, um, but have now come to appreciate through a different lens. And I sort of evolved from you know, being involved in that sort of organizational culture work as a, you know, a pro bono contributor, if you will, alongside my day job um, to, to leading global inclusion and diversity at Morgan Stanley, um, and then in the tech industry for companies like Apple and, and Twitter, as Michael mentioned. And so my work now um, um, is a little bit different, but quite related. Um, I lead a new program at Robert F. Kennedy Human Rights um, our organization is built on Bobby Kennedy's ideals of justice, equality, and peace. Um, and we consider our constitution, if you will, um, as a human rights organization, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, um, which of course is not irrelevant um, to some of what we've been talking about in the sense that the UDHR, um, as Donna of course knows quite well, is really based and founded and anchored on uh, the concept of dignity. Um, Article one says that we are all born free and equal in dignity and rights. And Article 23 of the UDHR is specifically focused on the workplace in that we are all entitled to just and favorable conditions of work, um, to favorable remuneration, uh, to a workplace free of discrimination and to um, remuneration that really affirms um, our human dignity. Human dignity is specifically built into Article 23 of the UDHR. And so as a human rights organization, you know, some may think, you know, without thinking too hard about it, like what is RFK human rights kind of doing in the workplace, if you will. Um, we believe that human rights don't stop at the workplace door. We all spend a third of our lives or more at work. I think it's only work is only rivaled by sleep. Um, and sometimes work actually outpaces sleep for many people, um, especially if you factor in commuting times and thinking times, because we're all sort of thinking about work way too often outside of the actual job itself. And so with people giving all that they give to an organizational enterprise and the organizational enterprise being successful and making a difference in the world or for their customers or clients or people whose services uh, they benefit, they can't do it without the energy and the work of 
the employees who are making a difference for whoever it is that the organization is serving. And so, um, you know, the fact that dignity should be centered in a workplace um, is not really that surprising when you think about it. The unfortunate thing is, is that um, most organizational leaders um, don't receive any guidance on how to uphold dignity in their workplaces, even though we of course get with the, our workplace is a major source of the affirmation of our dignity in our lives because we spend so much time at that place. And so it would be a shame if um, our dignity wasn't more centered in a specific way in the places where we spend so much time. And that's what our um, emerging, <coughs> excuse me, what our emerging work is focused on. Um, what does dignity in the workplace mean and how can um, it go from being more than a performative slogan? You see them in value statements, you see them in employee handbooks. You know, I'm in San Francisco in the Bay Area. We like to like post, you know, cool looking things on the walls. Um, so you may see dignity on a wall somewhere, um, but what does it really mean? And so um, the way that we're looking at this um, and more specific, um, you know, thoughts and actions will be forthcoming this fall. Um, you know, you could follow us about that. Just the plug that we're at RFK Human Rights on Twitter. Um, I am JMS San Fran on Twitter, uh, and we have a website, but that will all house um, our core thinking on this, which, you know, is we are very grateful for, you know, the example that Donna has set in her work and other leaders in this space, including Michael and, and many other people. But we're really thinking about it in terms of what is really the foundation? What does it all mean? Why do managers and leaders play a particularly special role? And if managers and leaders do play a special role, how do they execute on that in their day-to-day -day work? But that's only half of the equation. The other piece of it is like, is the systemic piece, the structural piece. It's not enough to talk to managers and leaders about how they make it real in their day-to-day -day work. It's also about looking at the structures that affect the entire employment experience. So we're thinking about the elements of dignity and other things as it relates not only to how you lead a team or how you lead a function or how you just lead as an individual, but really the sort of entirety of the employment life cycle. What does it mean to have a dignity-centered recruiting process? What does it mean to think more consciously about an onboarding experience? Um, what does it mean to have dignity-centered internal communications? Um, what does separation of employment look like and how can it affirm the dignity of people who are leaving the organization? And sort of scrolling forward through promotions, through compensation and benefits, through your external footprint and whether what you're saying in the world matches the internal reality for your people. I think about this a lot um, because I, I use an analogy of, you know, uh, uh, you're a new house, a new neighbor in a new neighborhood. Um, before you go running to your neighbors with muffins and baskets of gifts as a new neighbor or inviting them over for your first dinner party, you ought to be sure that your lawn is mowed and the shingles on your house aren't falling off and the plumbing works if someone has to use your toilet. So. We're really thinking about um, getting, getting our houses in order. Um, it's good to be out in the world and making statements if that feels right with your values. Uh, but if it doesn't ring true to your own employees, um, it could quickly diminish their dignity um, because what you're saying to the world and perhaps as a PR or marketing effort doesn't ring true to the experience that they're living in their seven, eight, nine or 10 hour days. So anyway, um, I'll sort of leave it there, but that's, that's some of how we're approaching this work. We're really excited about it. It's timely, um, you know, there's so many things happening in the world and you know, Bob has written about, you know, I, I go back to Bob's uh, LinkedIn post from before the election and just how in these incredibly volatile and charged times uh, where we're just not seeing each other or hearing each other, uh, there has to be a better way forward. Uh, Donna says that dignity is our common denominator, and it's quite time that we better recognize that. 
Thank you, Jeffrey. Thank you uh, for sharing your experience and, and, and how that concept became central <laughs> also in, in, in that attempt to transform dignity, not only in the space of human rights in policy work, but also in the workplace. So basically in, in our lived culture and experienced culture, and I think you pointed to some of the challenges we're experiencing all uh, in the political domain and, and all throughout the world at this point where we're, we're sort of basically violating dignity on purpose in many ways um, as a tool. So uh, without further ado, I want to invite Bob Chapman to share his experiences of really ch transforming his organization, I would, I would say, if I may, uh, from what we call an economistic one towards a humanistic one, one that focuses on dignity and, and really honors that value, that intrinsic value that Donna describes um, as, at, at the foundation. Uh, and maybe Bob, are you, I'm, I'm not seeing you right now on the screen. Can you speak up? Can you unmute? Uh -oh. ah. Okay. Now, can you hear me? Yes, yes, yes. Why don't you take it away? Um, I, first of all, thank you, Michael, for the opportunity to be with this amazing group of people that you've introduced. Uh, Donna is an inspiration to me. She uh, uh, has given me greater meaning and purpose than I would have ever imagined. But let me start off for this group with uh, well, let me explain. We've heard some very intelligent people talk. I'm a simple accountant born and raised in Ferguson, Missouri, okay? So you have to put that in some context, okay? So I'm not a psychologist, you know, I'm not a professor, I'm not an academic, I'm a pretty simple guy, blessed. But let me, let me, let me put all this dignity in context. When my granddaughter graduated from Aspen High School four years ago, and everybody was cheering as their child walked up to get their diploma. I had tears in my eyes because I knew the world we were sending this young lady into. We live in a world where 88% of the people in this world feel they work for an organization that does not care about them, okay? As Raj, my co-author said, we got a 20% increase in heart attacks on Monday mornings, okay? 65% of people would give up a salary increase if they could fire their boss, okay? Why would you want your child to go into that world, okay? That is the experience I had, and I wanted to give you that as the background. The word dignity was introduced to me by uh, really Tom Friedman when he wrote about the article, we, have, we don't have a poverty of money in this world, we have a poverty of dignity. And that led me to Donna who wrote the book. Uh, and let me just say to you, I don't use the word dignity. Raj and I came up with a name for our book, Everybody Matters, okay? Everybody Matters, okay? And, and that view came from my revelation that everybody in our span of care is somebody's precious child who in our work environment we have for 40 hours a week. When you don't look at the people in your span of care, as direct reports, accountants, engineers, machinists, hourly workers, salaried workers, when you look at them as somebody's precious child, it changes everything. I believe that we were blessed with a leadership vision that was the way we were intended to uh, live and work together. I believe that. I believe some higher power gave this accountant from Ferguson this vision of the way the world was meant to be. I believe that this vision addresses many of the societal issues we face in our families, our communities, and in the world, okay? We have been treating the cancer of, Barry Wimler has been out trying to change organizations, find people who believe what we believe, people like American Airlines and Myers Food Stores and Shell Oil Company. We've been trying to share our vision with them, but what we realize is we've been treating cancer, but we have not been curing cancer. What we've realized is that the cure for cancer is our education system. That is the issue we face. That is the, the vaccine. I asked the Harvard people one time, Jan Rifkin at Harvard, what was the purpose of education? And the original purpose in America was so we could, we needed informed citizenry so we could have a democracy. But the industrial revolution came along and we needed skills. And we thought that economic wealth created by the industrial revolution, which raised all of our society, which Raj talks eloquently about, was, was the, you know, peace and prosperity was the ultimate goal of our country. 
Yet prior to the pandemic, we had the lowest unemployment in 50 years. We had a robust economic environment and we were relatively peace in the world. And we had the highest anxiety and depression we have ever had. Why? We had peace and prosperity, okay? The reason is because, I'll go back to that statistic, if 88% of all people go home feeling that they are part of an organization that does not care about them, that is the issue we face, that when people don't feel valued, they don't feel dignified, they're gonna behave, as Tom Friedman said, with a great deal of uh, uh, frustration, rioting, unrest, because humiliation, which the lack of dignity creates humiliation, we are gonna see unrest like we've never seen before. So I would say to you that what we have is we have a society based upon successes, money, power, and position. Doesn't matter how you get it, as long as you have money, power, and position. That is our society. That's why we want a good education, okay? That's why our corporation fast because around the foundation, not human thriving, but human wealth creation. And so what we need desperately is that we need our education system to create human skills so we can create leaders. In the time we have young people in our education system, we need to give them the skills and the courage to, to feel cared for and to care for others. And we have accidentally learned how to do that because the foundation of truly human leadership is empathetic listening. Not listening to argue, not listening to debate, but listening to understand. When you look at the media every day, if you don't see as I see, the lack of our ability to understand each other, to work together to solve our problems, because we simply are, we, we, we teach in schools to debate and speech, but we don't teach listening. That is the biggest thing I want you to walk away with. The solution to the, what we face in this world, the lack of dignity to create people who feel valued is when you listen to them with empathy to understand, not to judge or debate, you create a sense of dignity and a sense of purpose that is beyond your imagination. I would say to you that in our company, so we began this journey very eclectically through a series of revelations that I had that changed me from management to what I consider truly human leadership. Management means, the word management means the manipulation of others for your success. Leadership is the stewardship of the lives entrusted to you. Looking at those people in your span of care as somebody's precious child and giving them a grounded sense of hope for the future. That is what we desperately need. Our education system has got to create human skills along with academic skills so we can create leaders in every part. I speak all over the world in every part of society, healthcare, education, uh, uh, the military, government, business, nonprofits, in every part, it's not just business, the, the level of suffering of people being used for the organizational goals is at an epidemic level, okay? That is the core issue. And when people feel used for somebody else's purpose, they don't feel a sense of dignity, okay? And that is the issue. So. My declaration of human rights is everybody in every part of our society deserves a leader who has the skills and the courage to care for them. That is the declaration of human rights that I see. Our vision for our company is we measure success by the way we touch the lives of people. That, okay, that came about at a time of the Enron scandal and a lot of government scandals where I said, Success in the world is too much about money, power, and position, and it needs to be the way we touch the lives of others. As Bill Urey at Harvard said, we need to move from a me-centric world. It's not all about me. It's about how we serve others, okay? That is where the greatest joy and the greatest satisfaction comes from. So again, I wanna to stress to you that we call it people, purpose, and performance, and the words are in that order. It starts with our fundamental right uh, obligation to the people we have the opportunity to be stewards of around a purpose that inspires them to share their gifts and then we have to create human and economic value we cannot sustain organizations if we are not creating value human value and economic value our share price so all these efforts we're talking about here in terms of caring for people which we actually have a university 
and uh, the three things that, again, this all came because somebody asked me 15 years ago, what is my greatest concern? I said, my greatest concern is I was blessed with a leadership model that could heal the world and it would die with me. And so I said, the next morning we got up and said, okay, you've now created my concern. How are we going to address that? And we decided we needed to create disciples who would believe what we, I would believe and would carry this well beyond my time and spread this around the world. The problem was we couldn't create disciples with our education system because they are skills factories. So we needed to create a university where we teach people how to be leaders. The unique thing is the three things we teach came from my experience in parenting six kids. It didn't come from my business school. It came from my parenting. And Simon Sinek and I always say, parenting and leadership is identical. Parenting is this precious people that come into our lives through birth, adoption, or second marriage that we all take very seriously. What is leadership? The stewardship of those precious lives of people that walk in our building around the world who simply want to know they matter. So we, the three things we teach are empathetic listening, recognition and celebration. How do you let people know they matter? Back to Donna's point, which gives them dignity. And then a culture of service, seizing the opportunity to serve others, moving from a me-centric to a we-centric, okay? That is what we desperately need. The interesting thing I want you all to understand is that when we teach those fundamentals at work, 95% of the feedback we get from our students and our company is that it changed their life. Their marriage is better, their relationship with their children is better. They don't say I ran a better accounting department or better sales department. They immediately go to the most important relationships. And as Raj knows, as Simon Sedek knows, when you meet our people in our company, which Michael is going to do, they describe our company as a family. Now, we're not related to each other. We don't employ everybody's kids. Why did they use the word family? Because what does the word family mean? The place of ultimate care. So when people describe our culture as a family, it is profoundly meaningful beyond just the words. It means they feel valued. And when they return home, they treat their spouse, their children, and they behave in, the, in their communities because they feel cared for. It is easy. To, we find that caring is contagious. That's good news. Caring is contagious. When you care for the people you have the privilege of leading, they naturally care for others because they feel cared for. So again, leaders' responsibility is to give the people in their span of care a grounded sense of hope for the future, okay? And, and, and in doing so, we give people a sense of security. They can go home and treat their families. When we see, when I spoke at Brown University to global university presidents, I was made aware that we have, which was startling to me, we have the highest level of anxiety and depression in incoming students university in history. Jen Rifkin said he's on a committee at Harvard to try and address this. Where did these kids came from, come from? They came from families in communities. We, why? Because the parents work for organizations don't care for them. They don't know how to treat each other. And the kids are experiencing this uh, in their homes and their families. So, I want to say to you, I am profoundly blessed to have found a co-author in Raj who's able to connect, connect conscious capitalism with uh, the healing organization, because we, we honestly believe, and I'll just say, Simon Sinek, who came in, the first person to come in to see our culture, he talked to our people for two days, and he said, I'm no longer a nutty idealist. I have just seen what I dream of. I dream of a world where you could tap anybody in the shoulder on any street in any city in the world and say, do you like the job? And they say, no, I don't like my job. I love my job. That is Simon's dream, okay? And Bill Urey came in because Simon said, you've got to see this. Bill Urey came in and said, spent two days talking to our people. He said he saw the answer to world peace. I said, Bill, how could you go into manufacturing operations in America and see the answer to world peace? He said, I saw a place where people genuinely care for each other, okay? So I would say to you that with all the McKinsey people have been in, Harvard uh, Jam sent seven of his top professors in, we honestly believe some higher power has blessed us this, with us because you are listening to an accountant from Ferguson, okay? There's no way I thought of these things. We have been blessed with this vision and I feel called and privileged to share this with the world because this will heal 
pain and suffering we're seeing in this world, despite economic prosperity, despite peace in the world, we do not have human prosperity. And our education system has got to start creating leaders who have the skills and the courage to care for the people they lead. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Bob. And, and I invite everybody to, to watch the, the documentary that is out on, on your uh, company in a transformation that went through and the uh, TED Talks and also, yeah, the, the books and, and the stories that come from people. And, and I think, uh, Raj, you're, you're here also. Maybe you want to comment briefly, but I also invite the panelists just to respond to each other in terms of what you see in terms of dignity as, as a potential for transforming business education, business, business research. Uh, Michael, I can just speak briefly. I actually have another meeting starting in, in a couple of minutes. Uh, but of course, uh, you know, my, my uh, introduction to this, this way of thinking uh, really deepened when, my, uh, when I worked on the book with Bob and got to experience firsthand multiple times in many locations the consequences of uh, treating people in this way and, and, and the great impact it has, multi-generational impact that it can have on people. I asked a group of middle-aged blue collar men the first time I, I went to Phillips, Wisconsin. I said, tell me what your life was like before your company was acquired by Barry Wimmiller and what changed? And before they could even speak, several of them had tears running down their face. And I was stunned, I said, you know, if you can get middle-aged blue-collar men to be that vulnerable in front of each other, there's something very special going on here. And then they started to talk about what their life was like, uh, the level of indignity uh, that they had experienced, uh, the frequent layoffs, the uh, uh, <clears throat> poor treatment by supervisors and bosses and so forth, uh, the tremendous economic insecurity their families suffered, where many of them were reduced to literally picking up cans and bottles I know before the Green Bay Packers game and trying to get some money to feed their baby. I mean, that level of, of, of struggle. And now their lives are completely transformed. And I remember the mayor of Phillips, Wisconsin, pointing to Bob and saying, that man saved our town because this town would have disappeared from the map because the company that employs six, 700 people in a town of 1400 was about to go under. And so the power of this is extraordinary. It's not only on the people working, it's on their children, it's on the community, it's on future generations. And, and that's where the seed of the idea of business as healing was really born for me, because you can do business in a way that makes money, but also causes a lot of suffering and exact surprise from people and the community, the, plant, the environment and everywhere else. Uh, or you can do it the way Bob does it, which is that it, it not only creates economic well-being, but creates uh, meaning and purpose and dignity and, and joy, uh, all of those things. And, you know, if you look at Bob, since the time we wrote the book, he's probably acquired another 30 or 40 companies. Uh, he's up to 120 or so now, never sold a single one. And I asked him at one point, Bob, you know, you don't need the money and, you know, you, you don't need the aggravation. Why do you do this? And he is driven by this idea that he wants to touch as many lives as possible, um, you know, in this lifetime. And I said, Bob, you're not running a business. You're, you're spreading a, a ministry. It's a healing ministry that when Bob Chapman comes to town, when Barry Waymiller acquires your business, you know, you're, you have a future, your children have a future. There's, there's all kinds of beautiful things that come out of that, you know. And so Bob feels an obligation to grow from that standpoint uh, because there are people waiting for this. The most businesses grow because they want to make more money and, you know, have more power and more impact. And that kind of growth can often come with a lot of suffering. It's like building an empire. Most empires in the world grew through conquest and, uh, and wars, right? And business empires, many are very often grow the same way. When 3G Capital acquires your company, they'll lay off 20, 30% of people and put everybody on strict cost controls. And it's just life becomes very grim under those scenarios. Whereas when a company like Barry Waymiller acquires a business, life transforms in the positive direction in every in every way financially and all the other dimensions so i think it's just uh, extraordinary and uh, i think this this framing of dignity i think is very powerful uh, because it is about putting the human at the center and 
you know, when we talk about wholeness, you know, that is, that's about healing and that's about holiness. And we are, we are uh, creatures that are worthy of, of that level of, uh, of care and treatment. So I want to thank you all. I have to actually run, but I did want to stop by. I'm here, Donna and Bob and Jim and, and Michael and everybody else. So thank you. Great to see you all. Thank you, Raj. Thank you for sharing your perspective. Much appreciated. Um, anybody want to comment from Donna? My, yep. Yeah, I, I just I love what Raj just said and on the heels of everything that Bob said as well. I want to share um, an experience uh, or many experiences that I've had around teaching dignity uh, in organizations and what and because I I, I think the suffering that uh, Raj was talking about just now and the need for healing, it comes out of ignorance. That's my experience. When I go into an organization and I introduce dignity, first thing I do is give them a whole, I call it a dignity 101 seminar. I share with them everything that I have learned so that we share the same language. And what is the common experience and the common reaction to learning about dignity is, oh my gosh, this is, this is common sense. How come I haven't, why didn't I learn this in school? I should have learned this starting in kindergarten. It should be in every public school system uh, uh, knowledge of this. But you know, in academia and in education, we have not been very good at teaching our students about the world within. And we talk about the world and all of the, you know, all of the, you know, academic pursuits, but we don't talk about the world within and what it feels like to be cared for, what it feels like to feel, to know that you are born worthy no matter what, all of these things. And the people, the leaders that I work with, they, they are just, they're almost embarrassed because they didn't know this already. And I say, hey, look, you know, we've got to take the shame out of this. Because if we shame each other for not knowing something that we've never been exposed to, I mean, I share Bob's passion in trying to do the most that we can here in our lifetimes to promote this, this, this mutual um, you know, desire to see people end suffering, and especially the kind of suffering that we can do something about. And so you know, Raj and, and, and Bob, um, I, I love their book. And in my book, I wrote about them and I said, you may not know it, but you are powerful dignity leaders. You know, they didn't use that language, but I, I gave them that title. You two are, you know, dignity agents of the best, the masters of dignity. So, so this ignorance, Michael, I think in answer to your question, what is the transformative power? Um, it's, it's just like any other piece of education. You know, if we start taking seriously the world within us and understanding what it means to be human, how that affects not only how we feel, but how that affects our relationships, what happens in, in particular in organizations or in the workplace when people feel that they have been recognized and, and, and seen, as I said earlier, it is extraordinary. And Bob is, you know, his, his team there, um, you know, they have done, they've been doing this now for years. So I'm, I'm, I just want to, I want to take the shame out of not knowing, right? I, because once, but, and I also always want to add to that, when you know, you're responsible. So once you get this stuff, I think it's our responsibility to share it, to make sure other people understand this, to treat our friends, our family, our coworkers, everybody we come in contact with, including our planet, uh, Jim, what, what it's like, and to show that we are really our humble servants of something so much bigger than, than us. This planet that we live on, this universe that we call home, you know, if we don't figure out how to take care of each other and how to take care of our communities, our nations, and everything, you know, outside of that, certainly our planet, it's our home is going to be in shambles. I like what, what Jeffrey said about the, our house. Is our house in order? I'm not sure our house is in order, but I'm sure that 
collectively, those of us here on this panel, we would all agree, we can do something about it. If I could just jump in on that. Um, I, so, I so agree with that. And Donna and I just coincidentally have been talking over the past couple of days about, you know, sort of on the, I mean, I don't even know. At first I would say the back end of COVID, but I don't even know what we can call it at this point. Um, but the idea that there are certain insights and understandings that we've been able to gain from each other, hopefully during this very long period in the sense that, um, you know, we've been in each other's homes or wherever it is that people have lived during this period of time, if we're fortunate enough to be able to do our work um, through virtual methods, which of course, many people can't. I mean, I think about, you know, Bob and manufacturing facilities, those are not remote work jobs. So the conversation is entirely different. But for those of us who have the benefit of being able to handle our work through you know, our research through Zoom or other methods, you know, we've been invited into each other's homes. Um, we've had to laugh at, you know, the, the meeting interruption. Um, maybe there are our mementos that we've talked about because people have seen them. Um, and we've just connected with each other in different ways. And I think it's important to remind each other, the people we work with um, and as leaders, that the deeper understandings that we've hopefully taken the time to, to gain during this period, we hang on to and we don't just hit a return button as if the whole thing never even happened. Um, and so I just think with moments of challenge and crisis, um, if there are, if there have been opportunities for people to, to develop those deeper understandings as human beings, it would be unfortunate and in some ways shameful if we didn't find intentional ways to hang on to those understandings. Um, and it's not always been easy. Um, I think about um, the challenges from a dignity perspective that, have, that Zoom and other virtual media have created in the sense of, um, I call it home self-consciousness, meaning that not everyone is comfortable or even proud um, of where it is that they might live. Um, you know, if we have, if we work in, 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 in situations where we have roommates or we're stuck in our bedrooms to do halls, these are self-conscious moments for people. Um, they may be interviewing for jobs and wondering and worrying about these sorts of things. The, the ways that we can demonstrate remote humanity and humanity in other ways, I think are fairly endless. And it's the dignity centered leaders or the dignity centered recruiting teams or whomever that are continuously thinking about this to build it into the fabric about how we operate as colleagues and leaders um, that can make a difference. And we all have the opportunity to not lose the connections that we form through moments of challenge, which, which can anchor us in smoother times, I think. Thank you, Jeffrey. Jim, you have your hand up. Uh, <laughs> very yeah, nice. I'm old-fashioned. Old <laughs> um, just a really quick point, and, this, and it's, it's Raj's comment about when um, Bob comes to town, uh, people feel safe and for themselves and for their children. Uh, and and it's, it, I guess this turns into a question for Bob, and I, I with any luck at all, I'm gonna get, get to meet you soon. Um, back to the big picture, um, I found myself thinking about in this whole conversation about Ron Engelhart's work, uh, the political scientist about in the world values surveys, he's been tracking attitudes around the world for decades. And what he finds is that and he's got a book called Cultural Evolution <clears throat> that I would recommend to anybody. Um, and what he finds is, is that uh, it's in the context of do attitudes shape behaviors or do behaviors shape attitudes. He finds that when, um, when people are secure, that's when you see the arts flourish. That's when you see attitudes towards women uh, being uh, well being filled with dignity. Uh, and same-sex legislation with respect to marriage happens. Uh, people are are open to the to others. Um, when they are insecure, we see xenophobia. We see auto we see autocracies. We see hostility to gay people. We see hostility to women. And he's got these data just laid out. And these 
these slopes are just you know, <laughs> you know, attitudes of survival versus security, the sort of attitudes of GDP per person. And it's just boom, like a slope of one. And you can see where, and you, we know where, you know, uh, you know, if you're gay and you go to Uganda, you know, it's, it's not the same as going to uh, Finland or, or someplace. Um, and Jeffrey, you shared your, your experience. And so you, you know this, I would imagine. They're just, he's got worldwide data. But, but the broader point is um, we are a function of our context that we don't necessarily shape the context in that, in that sense. That our, our attitudes can be a, a follow on that. Now, of course, we do shape our context. And so, um, but our whole conversation is about if we put dignity in our attitudes and our values at the center, then we can change the world. And I, I believe that in, in, in a lot of ways, but I'm also attentive to the fact that uh, prosperity does matter too, maybe if Ron has found something. And so um, I found myself this morning thinking about Dan Price and gravity payments and the $70,000 uh, job guarantee. Now that's a company of 100 or 200 people. <laughs> and I don't know that that scales necessarily, but, um, but I'm wondering, to, back to the Raj comment, and this is a question for Bob, um, once you get beyond that, or that through empathetic listening, um, is there is there economic security? How do you attend to economic security as well? And because that's also part and parcel of of this whole of whole equation. And maybe without it, we we are in a land of autocracy and xenophobia and worse. You know, I I I, I would let me. You were making Bob. Bob, can I, can I ask Rose uh, to ask her question because I think it ties in, and you may want to be answering those together. Rose, are you able to to share your question before Bob? Uh, Quickly. Yes, thank you so much. Mm. <clears throat> I'm very delighted to be uh, in this forum. And I teach business ethics in the Lagos Business School. And um, I find that a lot of the managers do not value the human being, the way the managers treat their people because of pressure from shareholders. All they think about is maximization of profits. I've been in a class where um, a chief executive officer told me that, you know, he doesn't really care anything about the human being, that's to get things done, that he, he reigns abuses, because I'm, I'm, I, I'm, I come from Lagos, I teach in Lagos, so, you know, the environment is quite different from what you have in the U.S. So, um, Rose, the way they treat bring the employees, the, question. the employees, what I'm trying to say is that some of the managers, because of pressure from shareholders to maximize profits, they do not value human uh, dignity. So in the, in, in the workplaces, managers put a lot of pressure on their employees. So I'm asking, how can we um, get um, shareholders to realize or to begin to focus on the human dignity rather than, rather than on profit maximization? How can we do that? Because that is what I get from the experience I have in the classroom. A lot of managers do not value the human person. All they want is to use them as tools to achieve their their benefit, uh, their profits. So I don't well, know if you understood you, what no, I was so, saying. Uh, let me answer your question. Uh, I called it people, purpose, and performance. Okay, it only makes sense. And uh, well, let me add one other point. We talk about sustainability is very important to all of us, and I think Jim talked about sustainability. Uh, and we can all relate to the sustainability of the earth and all the studies, but I am con desperately concerned about the sustainability of the human race. When we have our children having a level of anxiety, depression, drug addiction, issues we have, isn't that a massive crisis? We're not gonna have to worry about the earth if we as a civilization cannot live together in peace and harmony. And so I would say to you, my definition of sustainability is, is what we teach is how to live together and serve each other, okay? I always say, we're gonna put all the nonprofits out of business because we won't need nonprofits to fix what we broke, okay? We will have, when people feel cared for, they care for others. So let me go on to uh, your question. Um, our company, uh, you know, is a privately held company, but still we measured by any, like any other company. Our share price has gone up 14% a year, compounded for 25 years. We've outperformed Warren Buffett since 1997, he's at 8% compound growth and ours is 14%. It only makes sense 
even to an economic person, if you treat people with respect and dignity, they're going to share their gifts fully, okay? So you, I would say to you, our goal is to perform above industry norms to validate when you treat people with respect and dignity, they will share gifts with you beyond their imagination, go home feeling valued and treat their spouse and their children and behave in their community. So the problem, again, one of my revelations was I was at church and the rector of our church was my mentor and I loved his sermons. He, he inspired me. But one day I got up and I said, oh my God, Cynthia, Ed has only got us for one hour a week. We have people for 40 hours a week. We are 40 times more powerful to shape lives and send people home feeling valued so they can treat their spouse, their children, and others in the world as they have been treated. But again, going back to that statistic, which you got to, if 88% of the people feel they work for an organization that does not care about them, how can they go home and raise children to be good citizens, to care for others when they don't feel cared for themselves. So the heart of the issues we face, which is in your question, we have an economic model. Henry Ford made a lot of money and he needed a lot of people to make a lot of money, okay? But we never learned to care. We learned to use people for organizational success. And we know because we now teach it. So I'm not giving you a theory. We teach people how to be leaders. We have the language and we have managers, bosses, and supervisors, and we fire people, which came from the firing squad. The language is broken. We need leaders, coaches, and mentors who have the skills and the courage to care for the people. And those people will give them gifts beyond their imagination. It makes economic sense. It makes human sense. There's no piece of this. And again, I'm not giving you a theory. I'm sharing with you what we have 12,000 people around the world from China to Serbia, to Italy, to France, to Germany. It is a universal truth that people simply want to know they matter. And that is a skill we can teach in our universities. And we are now, we have our pilot program going on with a school in Charlotte, North Carolina, a prominent private school where we are going to teach from kindergarten to 12th grade, how to care to experience care and how to care. And we're working with obviously Michael, we're gonna, our team is, I just got pictures, our team is teaching Michael's MBA students right now, the fundamentals we teach in our university, which is how to care for the people you have the privilege of leading. It is a teachable skill. Our issue in the world is our universities, our skills factories. We get good raw material, which is the best students we can. We process them through the system and then we sell them to the market. And if the good demand, we think we're doing a good job. Our universities need to rethink the time we have these young men and women in our care. Are we preparing them to be leaders who have the skills of listening, recognition, and, and human skills, along with academic skills, so they can become leaders? Every part of our society and every part of the world is suffering from the lack of leaders who have human skills, along with professional skills. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Uh, Jim, does that answer your question about economic security and, and how to combine those? Um, <clears throat> he comes, he came right to the edge of it. <laughs> um, I, I, I don't, I don't, I, why would I ever deny anything you're saying? You've lived this. Uh, I am, but I am curious about the economic security of your employees as well, in addition to all that, especially if you're making money hand over fist. I, I'm gathering that you share that with. With your employees as well. Um, well, our expression in our guiding principle of leadership is we treat, we pay people fairly and we treat them superbly. What we have found when you don't treat people with respect and dignity, pay is the only denominator they care about. In our situation, I will tell you the number of people that's in interviewing with us that say, I, I, I heard about, I watched your TED talk, I heard you speak, this is where I want my child to work. This is where I want to work, okay? And so I would say to you that, again, it, it only makes sense when you treat people with respect and dignity, not only are you going to do a societal benefit, but you're gonna, they're gonna share their gifts with you beyond your imagination. So again, I, I only emphasize the success of our company financially. And again, remember we're the combination of 120 acquisitions around the world. This is not an American issue or a business issue. 
I see the pain in healthcare. I see the pain in our universities. I see the pain in the military and government. We are experiencing in our silly, the lack of dignity because we are using people for our purposes rather than caring for people so they can be who they're intended to be. So we need leaders. We don't need any more managers or bosses or supervisors. The world desperately needs in every part of our society, leaders who have the skills and the courage to care for the people they have the privilege to lead. Wonderful. And uh, I think Jim, you will also come and explore a little bit more <laughs> deeply what the what the possibilities or what the on ground reality may be, as some of us have the privilege to experience Bob's Phillips planned and, and see how, how that is working. There are a number of questions we were supposed to, quote unquote, stop by now and move into a break, but I'm also happy to play now. I want to make sure the panelists are okay with that as well. There are questions from Gerard that I want to uh, ask quickly. Gerard, can you be very quick in your question? Yeah, uh, yeah th thanks, Michael. Uh, my, my question is about uh, in quotes participants, uh, Jim, beyond the boundaries of the firm. Uh, particularly, and I think this uh, Kylie has has raised a similar kind of question there. So, so maybe we could pull in Kylie too. But but really, uh, often the unknown and unseen participant, often involuntary. Uh, example is the people of Lytton in in uh, in Canada, whose whose city was was destroyed, uh, but possibly not because anything or. They, they didn't really impact it that much, but but climate change has impacted them. So uh, I, I think uh, at least intellectually, it's easy to focus on employees within the firm, but, uh, but there is the question of the impact of a firm's actions way beyond its boundaries. And uh, I was hoping we could focus on that. I will remind you, our statement is, we measure success by the way we touch the lives of people. We touch the lives of the team members. We touch the lives of our customers, our suppliers. We, we touch a lot of people's lives. And our, that is our guiding principle that drives, inspires our behaviors, not just our team members. We're not just a focus. We, we are trying to validate the trust people place in us in our communities and be good stewards of that trust. Michael? Mm -hmm. Um, can I just say one brief yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. response to uh, Gerard? I think uh, it's important to um, understand that when you learn about dignity and when you create a consciousness about the effect of your actions on other people and how you react when other people treat you well, when you have that consciousness and you learn about everything, all of the science behind treating people with dignity and there's a lot once you learn that this is something that you changes you on the inside and it doesn't just stop at the workplace you go out into your family and you're gonna see things differently it's about the way you interact with fellow human beings in the world so it doesn't really yes fortune if we're fortunate enough to have a company that is dignity conscious and whose leaders do care about treating um, the well-being of their employees and treating each other well. This, this is a, a phase of our human development that has been virtually, as I said earlier, ignored up to this point. So it creates a cognitive shift, an emotional shift, a shift in our understanding of how the world works. So it affects everything, Gerard. Hey, uh, yeah, Donna, I was to add real quickly, a McKinsey partner in Amsterdam heard the speech I just gave you, and he, was, he had a bad taxi ride in Amsterdam, and he was ready to be pretty upset with the taxi cab driver, and then he thought about my speech, and he said, you know, that taxi cab driver is somebody's precious son, and I'm going to talk to him like I would talk to my son. So you're right. When we teach people how to treat each other, people treat others outside our company better and, and the world starts healing and so the brokenness we're seeing every day. Great. I also think on that point, um, just to make a quick one, that we all have the opportunity either because of our roles or our life experiences to, you know, 
leverage the influence we have on other systems. And so on the investor point, I do see many investors thinking differently about how they hold the companies they invest in accountable, um, whether you call it you know, accountable on dignity or on other drivers of dignity. Um, we're seeing more of that and that's a good thing. Um, you see it also with companies thinking differently about the workers who are in their supply chains. They not, may not be directly employed, but if you're using company X to help produce services or goods, you have the ability to influence company X. Um, and it's the same thing at a much more basic level um, when we you know, walk through our daily lives. Um, I think a lot about you know, not just honoring dignity in the workplaces that we work in, but how do we honor the dignity of workers in workplaces other than our own? Um, the taxi cab driver is a worker in a workplace. Um, as a passenger, you have the opportunity to see that person or not see that person. And I think that became more important to many people or more obvious to some people during COVID-19. Um, you know, think about um, seeing and recognizing essential workers um, or not. Um, I, my mom, we worked on a, an idea for the community that she and my dad live in, which is how they can acknowledge their mail carrier in their community. This is a person who often goes unseen, but was you know, compelled to work during the pandemic, often in ways that could be at risk to that person. And so I think if more of us find ways either through the structures that we control in the workplace or in our day-to-day -day lives to see, to hear, to listen to, and to acknowledge um, other workers and other worker experiences, um, we can, you know, in the words of our namesake in my organization, be ripples of hope in the world. Right, well, that's a wonderful ending statement. And I know that there are a couple more questions. Russell, I saw your question. Thank you for getting in. And I, I, I apologize that we won't be able to get to all of them because we wanted to give you a break before the workshop, but I invite you all to stay on. Um, and I wanna thank again, uh, all of you who came and especially of course, Jim, Donna, Jeffrey, and Bob for joining for today. Uh, I really appreciate it. it shows the questions and the comments that we have in the chat, which we'll make available uh, that, uh, that there is much more to be discussed and much more to, to be uh, learned. And so we will take this up and, and, and offer more conversation opportunities. So thank you all. And PJ, over to you. Yes, thank you, Michael. And thank you everybody for that wonderful panel. You all were, were excellent. Um, like Michael said, we're gonna take a quick break here. We are going to come back together in about 15 minutes at uh, 1145. So right now though, what we're going to do is I'm going to open up some breakout rooms that you can choose to enter. So I've um, named them, I have eight, 10 different rooms that you can choose to enter. Um, and I've named them different, different topics. So you can move into the one that you're interested in. Uh, room nine and 10 are just miscellaneous, right? So you can jump in. Um, but we have learn about EMA, which is the first one, transforming practice, transforming management education, transforming policy, uh, transforming research. We have a room for AI technology and dignity. This is an area that EMA is going to, uh, we want to focus on this year a little bit. So we're um, trying to get a group together to maybe build in that area. Uh, qualitative inquiry. I'm interested in trying to pull together qualitative researchers to create a community within, um, you know, within EMA to move this forward as well. We have dignity in the workplace. And then rooms nine and 10 are really just uh, miscellaneous. And when you go into your rooms, feel free to have the discussion that arises there, okay? And I will close the rooms out probably uh, in about 12 minutes or so, so that we all have time to come back for the next piece. Any questions? Okay, and you don't have to join a room, you can 
hang out here. You can turn your camera off, get a cup of coffee, take a break. And at 11.45, we'll be back with Michael Gelb. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you.
Perfect. Michael, so you were able to close the close the rooms? Yes, I did not see you, but I thought we, we, we had a commitment that we would do this now. Yeah, yeah, we are. We are. Sorry. We okay. were. All right. Michael, there you are. Hey there. Can you hear me? Michael, can you speak? Yes. Hello. Hello. Oh, okay. Great, great, great. Perfect. Perfect. Wonderful. Well, uh, thank you all for, for staying on. We had a, a stimulating conversation in our room. I know that. Uh, we, we had a stimulating panel. Uh, I think you all uh, are here for that reason. What we're trying to do now is sort of building on, on these insights uh, to figure out what can we do with it. Okay, this is nice to have these panels. And what we're trying to figure out is how can we build on our own innovative creative potential that may slumber in us, but that we can all activate at a higher level. I would, I would, I would bet we can all activate our own creative potential as academics, as change makers. And, and Michael and Raj, they wrote this book, The Healing Organization. I, I would throw out that we can be agents of a healing organization that is our universities, that is our places. That's where we can be active. And I think that's where a lot of what uh, Bob Chapman is talking about, the vaccine. This is where we can deliver the vaccine. So in that context, and with the premise that sometimes we might not give our own creative power so much credibility, or we might not give our own change-making potential so much power, that we engage in this conversation. And Michael and I will start the conversation. You are welcome to join, chime in and, and have uh, quest, put questions in the chat that we can potentially have Michael answer. And then in the next half hour, the last half hour, we'll break out into breakout rooms again with the, tip, with the focus on two. What can we change in terms of business research? And what can we change in terms of business education with that concept of dignity in the background? So is that clear enough as a framework? We're going to have a, a general conversation with Michael, and then we're going to have that the, the workshops. OK? Perfect. Breakout rooms. So Michael, you are an expert in creativity and innovation. You have written about this in many highly interesting books, and I can just recommend it to everybody also. My kid, who's 10 years old, just read uh, 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 How to Think Like Leonardo da Vinci, and he's excited. And, 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 <laughs> and uh, you see how he sees the world differently by that. Uh, and he has this change maker creative potential that he uses in many different ways. So Michael, what are some of the things that you see and observe in your coaching in high executives and, and others that you think might uh, help us all here as professors mostly in, in institutions to become change makers, to put in place what we say we deeply want to see in the world, uh, but where we oftentimes have excuses like the dean doesn't let me, um, et cetera, et cetera. Wow. Well, first of all, thank you for the introduction and it's great to be with everyone. I'd actually like to start by reflecting back on what Bob Chapman just shared with us, because Bob is, is an embodiment of the vision of the healing organization. You mentioned the book that uh, Raj Sisodi and I crafted together, and Bob Chapman was and is one of the inspirations for the book seeing what he was able to do, the transformation he was able to bring about, the way he takes these really wonderful aspirations, these truly noble ideas, and has successfully brought them to life in a very down-to-earth series of businesses in a very profitable way. Raj and I spoke to the people at Barry Wayne Miller companies, and, and the stories touch your heart, the way people's lives are transformed when their whole career up to a certain point, they were treated as functionaries, as objects, and they, they connect with Bob Chaplin and they get treated as soulful human beings with, with potential. It changes their life, it changes communities, so one of the things that Raj and I experienced when we were writing the book 
is obviously we went really deep into conversations with people like, like Bob and, and we were looking for other people around the world and other institutions, other organizations that were embodying this, <laughs> this ideal of business making the world a better place. And it was a transformative experience. Us, even though we had this idea and we've been involved in this work and this was our, this has always been my orientation uh, as a consultant uh, uh, since uh, the late 1970s, I taught my first leadership retreat for a, a global multinational and it just seemed to me, gosh, wouldn't it be great if, if companies, if business took the lead in making the world a better place? And when I started out, it was, it was kind of a quixotic solo notion. I thought I was just thinking this by myself, but over the years I started to meet other people who had this same, same vision. And I was also blessed early in my career to be engaged by visionary leaders who genuinely cared. So I got to see that this was really possible in a practical way. And after being involved in this, whether it's called the healing organization or conscious capitalism, there's also lots of other language that's origin about this notion, this fundamental notion is let's leverage the power of business to make a better world and support human dignity and human rights and human opportunity and the well-being of our planet. And as Bob, truly human leadership to, to come back to Bob's signature line. So having immersed myself in this uh, approach for my whole life, I have to tell you that writing the book and going even deeper into these conversations with these people took both Raj and I to a whole other level of inspiration and a sense of, of possibility and a sense of passion. So it was taking an idea we already had that business could be leveraged to make the world a better place and that's the real purpose of business and relating to it on a, on a much, much deeper level. Such that Raj and I, when we, would, we were writing the stories, we would read the stories back and forth in the book, we would both have tears in our eyes. And I still do, I can't, get, I can't read my own book without, without feeling the sense of, wow, this is just such a profound hope for humanity. So my, my simple point is that part of how we share this is by telling stories and by being directly connected and hearing the stories of people who are actually making this happen. I don't know about you, but I mean, I know Bob uh, Chapman, we've interviewed him, we wrote about him in the book. I've heard him say pretty much everything he just said, and I could probably say a lot of it, but hearing him say it again, the authenticity with which he says it, I feel even more inspired. So I, I have a sense of what's possible for what business can become, and obviously, we're all brought together by our passion for thinking about what can business schools do to help make that transformation. So that's my preface to come back, uh, Michael, to your question about, we all have this greater power. It's probably greater than we thought. How do we get access to it? Well, the simplest way to start is to surround yourself with really creative people and to go deep into the stories of people who've lived beautifully creative lives. So you know that it's now research validated. You know the old motivational speaker line from the 80s and 90s, it used to be, uh, you are the average of the five people you spend the most time with. So if the five people you spend the most time with are depressed or unhealthy, your chances are of being depressed or unhealthy are much greater. But if the five people you spend the most time with are healthy and energized and passionate, you're more likely to be healthy, energized, and passionate. And now it's not just the five real people you spend time with, but also the virtual people you spend time with. So what I've been doing for the last 
45 years is spending time virtually with some of the most creative people who've ever lived. Michael Pearson mentioned Leonardo da Vinci. I literally went to the place where Leonardo was born and the place where he died. I walked his footsteps. I remember being in the room where he lived in France for the last three years of his life and looking out his window and, and conjuring in my imagination, just how did he really see the world? I read his notebooks over and over again and abstracted from those. I, I asked one simple question, what can we learn from him? What's he trying to teach us? And abstracted from him these lessons, these seven principles. So spend time with the most creative people you can, real or virtual, if you wanna be more creative. Tell stories of, learn the stories, meet the people who are changing the world through business. Because when you do, it will give you the energy, it will give you the inspiration, it will give you the passion to go deep into finding how we can actually translate that into our classes and into our institutions and into our courses and into our curricula. Okay, so spend more time with uh, really creative people. <laughs> Maybe it's more possible than ever to do this uh, and, and, and learn the stories. So part of what we're doing here is, is that an amp up sort of our creative sort of community. On the other hand, what happens if you are typically surrounded by bureaucrats or by a bureaucratic <laughs> mindset and you just don't have the luxury to do this? So uh, uh, just the reality looking at my own sort of typical environment is much more can't do, you can't do, you can't do, right? Um, and so what can be done? If, if that is the, the, the sad state of affairs, because we just can't all go back to Leonardo da Vinci or... <laughs> well, actually, we, we can and we must, but, but let's just... So let me empathize uh, and acknowledge the reality of what you're saying, because I, I, I've taught at many business schools. Uh, I won't, I won't, I'll, I talk at one entrepreneur, entrepreneurship program. They wanted me to come in and, and, and lead this. I, I don't want to give any hints as to who it is. I'll, I'll protect, I'll protect the guilty. <laughs> but I was supposed to give this uh, inspirational seminar on thinking creatively for entrepreneurs at an entrepreneurship group sponsored by a major business school. And my process for, 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 for just getting engaged to do this, I had to fill out a 30 page form. I mean, I, I just, I was, it was one of those, is this really happening kind of moments? And I get it. Uh, the everyday grind of dealing with big bureaucracies can suck the creative life out of us. Which is why we have to be really creative to figure out how to regenerate ourselves, recharge ourselves, and why it does start with each of us individually. Because yeah, that is a given. There are lots of constraints. The, the default setting is we can't do anything different. There's lots of resistance to change. And it's, it's, it's true in education across the board. Uh, it's certainly true in government. Uh, so when I first moved to the United States, uh, moved back, you know, I grew up here, but uh, I spent eight years living in England where I did my graduate work and started my business. And in 1982, I, I moved back and, and guess where I moved? I moved to Washington, DC. Why did I move there? Yes, I wanted to change the world by teaching creative thinking and innovative leadership to government. Well, how did that work out? 
<laughs> I, I couldn't believe that. I mean, I found a few clients who were interested, a few pockets of government, but generally government had no interest. So then I turned, I, th I thought, well, education, let's, and I was thinking about not university level education at that time, but just working with, with schools, with, and building in creative thinking and leadership to school, starting at elementary school, junior high and high school. But it, it was, the resistance was massive. I mean, you know, again, there were a few people who were really inspired who took me up on it and I, I taught it, different programs around the world uh, for schools and educators. But the vested interest what seemed to be in keeping things the same. So I was actually surprised to discover when it was businesses that were engaging, that it was businesses who were actually interested because their performance metric, their accountability was less bureaucratic. And that created more, more possibility and more opportunity. So I don't wanna pretend that, well, gee, this is easy or we'll just magically shift the way business is conducted at business schools. I don't, if I had a magic answer for how to navigate through bureaucracy, I would have transformed the government and education 40 years ago. So what I can say, however, is that you have domain over your own potential for creativity. You can make that a part of your life. That's something you can develop. You can become more solution oriented yourself. You can develop more strategies for finding solutions, for looking at problems in different ways. And, and it's all upside because as you learn this, it's, it's a skill. Hi, Mary. Hi. Hi. Yeah. One. What? Ron, Neza, can you mute yourself, please? So creative thinking is a skill. You can learn, it's like learning a language. There are principles, there are practices, there are methodologies. And while we're working on ways of restructuring systems to be less bureaucratic and more streamlined and more agile, the best place to start is to work on ourselves to develop those competencies. So, so what would those competencies be and what would you recommend like in a five minute quick uh, or an elevator ride to a CEO, what can they do? Uh... Well, in terms of practical methodologies and techniques, uh, one of the things that I teach right up front to everybody is the skill of mind mapping. And I teach it not just as a note-taking methodology, and by the way, it's a great methodology for generating and organizing your ideas. So if you wanna, for example, write a paper or prepare a class that you're going to teach or lay out a curriculum or make a strategic plan for an organization, it's a, profoundly powerful and useful tool. But the best part when you learn it properly, and hey, Michael, you know what we can do is, uh, uh, I'll send you the link we can share with people. I made a three hour seminar on mind mapping. It's, it's free. We'll give people the free link to that. And you, I, I brought together, I learned mind mapping from the person who invented it, a gentleman named Tony Buzan. And we had a group uh, back in, in London in the 70s called the Learning Methods Group. And I brought together three other original members of that group who've used mind mapping for 40 years to write all kinds of books and develop all kinds of businesses. Mm -hmm. And I 
facilitated this seminar just because I'm so passionate about this as a simple, practical thing. You can learn to generate more ideas in less time, make better connections between those ideas, and integrate the more logical, analytical part of your mind with the more imaginative and playful part of your mind. And why do we think of Leonardo da Vinci? Generally, people agree that Leonardo is the greatest genius who ever lived. Why? Because we think of him as a great genius of both science and art. He created some of the greatest artistic masterpieces the world has ever seen. And he was a pioneer in anatomy, botany, geology, uh, and so many other areas, not to mention uh, his inventions. Uh, so, He's a prototypical supreme Renaissance genius. And Tony Bizan will tell you that when he created mind mapping, part of the inspiration to create it was his study of the notebooks of Leonardo da Vinci. Because he was trying to get into the mind of how did this mind work? And that, that's a big part of what I've been doing is looking at how, how did the mind of a great inventor like Edison work? Can you just share sort of the, 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 the key pieces that distinguish those two? Like, what is it that we can all, maybe just for now, maybe look into deeper to some of these, but you have seven principles for Da Vinci and a couple for Edison. Can you just share briefly sort of the highlights that may be lacking? So seven principles for thinking like Leonardo Da Vinci. The first one is to Re revitalize your birthright of curiosity and to focus more on asking questions than on finding answers. The second one is to cultivate independent thinking and the discipline which used to be taught in every liberal arts program of considering and arguing from multiple points of view so that you really can say that you've thought through a question. Leonardo said, when you come to any important question, you must look at it from three different perspectives. The third principle is to sharpen all your senses and deepen your appreciation of beauty. So, you know, the simplest thing is put a flower in your office, put some art up on the walls, <laughs> put some aromatherapy like I have here in my office, put pictures of people who inspire you. So create an inspiring, beautiful environment. This goes back to Plato as the way to nurture the soul and develop our creativity. The fourth is to embrace uncertainty, smile like the Mona Lisa in the face of change. So learn to see change and ambiguity as an opportunity for creativity rather than as a cause of anxiety. The fifth principle is to balance the two sides of your uh, cognitive functioning, integrate logic and imagination. So we already talked about mind mapping as a practical way to do that. The sixth principle is to cultivate your physical energy because without stamina and, and core energy, you're certainly not gonna have the energy to change the bureaucracy uh, or make any big change. So any, a missing link in genius is it takes energy. You wanna be in training, you wanna be fit, you wanna look after yourself, diet, exercise, rest every single day. And what's great is, uh, Leonardo gives specific practical advice on how to do this 500 years ago, which is evidence-based today and scientifically validated. And the seventh principle, connexione, everything connects to everything else. So learn to be a systems thinker, look for the greatest point of leverage in a system, see how everything connects to everything else. And there's a quick, those are the quick seven, those are the seven Da Vinci principles without us going into the Italian side of it, which I'd love to do when we have more time. Great. And anything that you think particularly worked well with your co in your coaching your CEO clients or other types of clients, executive clients, in terms of taking that on? Because I, I would see that's something what we can learn from and maybe we can look into more each of us or maybe it, as the International Human Management Association when we put on lunch and learns, we can, we can uh, focus on some of those uh, elements also. What would you suggest? So in terms, of, in terms of the most effective methodology for coaching, is that what you're asking? No, 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 I'm actually asking like 
what are some of the most effective pieces that you have seen uh, in, in your coaching that work to get people from, let's say, a can't-do approach to a can-do approach or really yes. just get to that uh, Leonardo da Vinci type of tapping into their own genius, uh, no matter where they are? Well, that's a great question, and, and I have a very clear answer for you. My friend Tony Buzan, I, I mentioned him before, was uh, one of the world's great inspirational speakers. And his greatest passion was to try to bring all of his work into schools and to help kids grow up using their creative potential. And he had this ability, he would look at a child and, and the child would just feel smarter. And it turns out that that's what the best the best teachers do. You know about the Rosenthal effect, right? If the teacher thinks everybody is uh, below average, guess what happens? Everybody performs below average. If the teacher is told that these are gifted ch children at the end of term, they all perform 25% above the norm. And the only difference is the attitude of the teacher. Same thing works with drill sergeants. It's also called the Pygmalion effect. So what we look for in others what we, the, the, the expectation we hold for them in terms of their possibility profoundly influences those other people. So this is, this is part of you know, all the research into microaggression and how oppression often takes place without people even realizing it. Because, and it's, it's, it's not some mystical, it's, it's in facial expressions. If you think, if you're, prejudice against something, someone, and you think they're not going to perform well, it shows up, you know, they're, they're struggling to answer a question and the teacher's making a little movement like this. Whereas if the teacher is told that that child is gifted or the teacher has some preconception that that child is better able to answer, when the same, when the child is struggling, that teacher is making encouraging uh, body language messages. So that's what I do for my CEOs is I encourage them to be more creative than they ever thought they could. You know, I, I was coaching a CEO through uh, uh, when, when, when COVID first hit, he lost, uh, he had to furlough 40% of his people. And he's a humanistic healing organization type leader. He was, it, it caused him tremendous emotional difficulty, but he had to do it to keep the company alive. And I coached him every week through that. And every week he wrote a special message to the people who were furloughed. furloughed. They, 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 he also came up with a strategy to make sure that all their, their needs were met, that nobody, uh, that everybody could pay their rent, that everybody had enough food, that everybody still had health care. And he reached out to them or had a member of his senior team reach out to them on a weekly basis with messages of hope that will bring you back as soon as we can. By the way, he also took a 20% pay cut during that time. Uh, and he brought them all back. So I, but I, basically what did I do for him? I helped him keep the faith that we could get through this because it's lonely at the top. You know, it's great. We're, we're at the Olympics now, and hopefully, well, de definitely we're going to see gold medals won. It just hopefully it'll be somebody that you're rooting for. And when they, when they, this 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 will happen today, and it'll happen all this week, you'll see. They're interviewing. They always say, "How do you feel?" And they say, "Oh my God, I can't believe it. It's a dream." And then they say, uh, uh, "Tell us more." Uh, uh, how, you know, what made this possible for you? And then they say this, they say, I never could have made this happen if it weren't for my, they say my coach, my mom, my dad, my uncle, my brother. And then they say this, who always believed in me. And I think what touches me the most is when I, when I especially when I come across examples of people who have risen from the most disadvantaged backgrounds, where everything in their world told them they were worthless, where everything in their world, every message they got was you're nobody. 
but one person said, no, you're somebody. One person said, you're somebody. And that one person can change that child's life forever. And the same thing works with, with grownups. <laughs> so be the person whose belief in others makes the difference in their lives. And if you, if you hold, if, and, and how do you get that? By developing your own human potential, by cultivating your own self-belief, especially, and it's especially hard to do when, when we're all struggling and having difficult time. I'm not immune from that. Uh, uh, but that's when we have to reach down. And also, it's also when we need even more, my list comes back to every day, Create an environment, create as many practical reminders as you can. I mean, literally, on your desk, next to your bed at night, that help you focus your mind, your attitude, your heart on your highest values, on what inspires you the most, on your sense of purpose. And that, that helps cultivate the energy that lets us then fight the battles we need to fight and deal with the bureaucratic stuff we need to deal with and, and still come out smiling. Okay, great. So believe in ourselves and, and practice through action, small and large. Uh, and I think doing it together in community, I think that is a critical piece. So even if it's just two people or maybe the space that we are able to create here as well. So these are, uh, these are the, the foundations possibly in which we can engage in our workshop. And I uh, invite you to, if you're interested in, in, in Michael's work, please check it out. It's, it's highly informative, engaging. And I always come out more creative, more alive and uh, transformed. So thank you, Michael, for being here. Um, one thing that I learned from a mentor of mine, Ellen Langer at, at, at Harvard, is she, who sort of teaches mindfulness, the psychology of mindfulness. One word can change how you see things. And I was already putting in the chat uh, management education and management research, transforming them, right? What I, what I remembered when you were speaking was like, no, we, it's not about what, it's like how. It's like, and it's not about whether, it's how. So most of the conversations that we have, even if we're all oriented towards creativity and creating solutions are oriented towards whether we can do something, not so much how we can do something. So what I'd like to invite us all is to go with that question into the breakout rooms and just think about how can we change management education? How can we change management research to create those healing properties for ourselves and others in a way that we can be that transmission mechanism, the vaccination uh, uh, network that Bob Chapman was talking about. So thank you, Michael, for being here. Um, what's happening with the, oh, okay. Yeah, so I created- Did you do that? Oh, okay, because I had it on my end also. Okay, so yeah. let's, let's focus on, on the how to do it, not whether and, uh, and uh, we have about 20 minutes time. We'll come back around 12.45. We have a bit more than 25, uh, 20 minutes. So thank you so much. Michael, would you be willing to join one of those workshops or just hop in between? Uh, uh, sure. OK, thank you. I'll All right. Uh, you move me around. PJ, can you, can you do that? I can, yep. Thank you. All right. And, and uh, yeah, please everybody choose your room. And I'll be choosing management education. So thank you all.
Excuse me to speak out loud, but if there's only two rooms, won't they be very, very large for conversation? Um, I'm trying to see how many people. It may be. It You've may already be. got quite a lot in transforming management education. I'm just thinking of systems. I'm always thinking of systems. <laughs> All right. Let me see if I can add a room from this. You can add rooms. The question is how to do it so people know where to go. Right, right. Hi. Also, yeah. when you have a second, I'm not able to move myself. I'm not able to join um, Transforming Research. It's Puna Marora. I'm wondering if you can put me in there. If you put your link, your cursor over the number on the right of transforming research, it will turn to join. It didn't, but I just got the message. So thank you, PJ. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, let me see breakout rooms. Yeah, it's not letting me. I don't see how to add it. Um, breakout rooms, participants invite. Once the rooms are open, I know you can add when they're not open. But if you want to stay in this main room, we could talk about um, things as well in the main room. Uh, either one, either the transforming management education or transforming research. So why don't we do that? Why don't we stay in the main room? And for people who like, like you said, there's already a lot in the breakout rooms. So if there's anybody who wants to discuss those two questions in the main room, we can do that here as well. Thanks, PG. I think I I have to go. <laughs> That's okay. Um, Thank you for joining it us. Was, it was amazing. I would really like to be updated. <laughs> um, <laughs> then. But thank you. Thank you so much for also for the invitation. It was amazing. Good. I'm really glad that you could come. Yeah. See you. Bye. Bye. Oh, Roseo, how are you? Rose, are you there? Yes. Oh, I was just wondering how, how you're doing and did you wanna talk about one of the uh, questions in the main room or just hang yes. out? Yes, yes. I was thinking that um, uh, one way to focus on changing the education is um, the universities is to say perhaps to get the deans to st start teaching human dignity as a subject or maybe as a subject in the business ethics um, curriculum. I think that would be one way. In, in our school, we have, apart from the business ethics class, where we talk about, you know, um, uh, the responsibilities of organizations to employees, to customers and all of these people where we bring this thing up about human dignity there. We also have a, a, a subject we call a nature of man, mm. nature of man. And in that um, course, you know, we try to talk about human dignity to actually tell people the importance of the human being, why the human being needs to be treated with uh, human dignity. I think that if many schools go that way, that it will help to uh, you know, make um, organizations of managers aware of the fact that they need to treat people with dignity. Yeah, I, I like that idea of including dignity as a 
a main as a main component of the business ethics, right? And treating and what does that mean and what does that look like in organizational settings? Because um, I think so. I teach a you know a business ethics course, but we don't necessarily delve into that topic. And so I think that's an important insight to really bring that in, right, into the the ethics. And I know Erica is part of the, is it the Don Donahue um, Ethics Center? Hi, uh, yes. And have you guys um, incorporated that idea of dignity into any of the curriculum in the, for business ethics? So um, actually my co-director, Alisa Magnet, who I think may be in a different room right now, is, uh, res is responsible for the um, sort of baseline intro to ethics that all of our first year students are required to take. Mm -hmm. And um, as someone who's been getting more and more familiar with humanistic management over the last few years, I know that she's made a significant effort to make sure that the notion of dignity is woven in and humanistic management and protecting um, well-being as well as dignity is woven into to that baseline first year class. I think she she may also, she teaches it both online and in person. Um, she would be someone to connect with. I, I actually don't teach business ethics. I teach managing change. Um, but in teaching managing change, I also try to weave in um, notions and exercises related to dignity. Um, but as far as business ethics specific curriculum, you might touch base with Elisa, E L I S S A, Magnant, M A G N A N T. And she's at UMass Lowell. Okay. And I know. Um, Ema also has some resources on our site about um, different um, ways that curriculum is being adapted as far as um, infusing I, notions of dignity and humanistic management. So there's that as well. PJ, do you have that link available? I don't have the link um, at this point, but I do know that we are trying to create a nice repository of curriculum and and design elements to include into in various uh, courses. Um, and I think that's going to end up on our membership website, I believe. So, but yeah, but we are working on creating that kind of repository. We're not quite, I don't, I know we have some um, on the EMA website, but I don't think we have it all quite yet um, there, but let me find the, Okay, thank you, Erica. Please, can you put it on the, the details on the chat for me? I'm going to give you Elisa's um, details. Email. Yes, I'll get you her email and okay. um, so you can connect directly with her. Okay, and, thank um, you. She also has been using some really good open source um, textbooks that I think she's sort of been pioneering that at our institution, which has been nice for some of our students who have a lot more trouble affording some of the heavyweight textbooks. Um, so that's another thing you, that I think she's had a, a lot of success with and is always happy to talk with everyone about. Let me get that for you. Okay, um, thank you. Yeah, and I'm also gonna post the uh, overview PDF again because that will have links um, and information on, I think some of the curriculum pieces that we've been doing. I'm looking for Elisa's email. I should know it by heart, but it just pops up in my messages when I send things. So. But yeah, and I think I think what's interesting too is I, I try and pull in the humanistic management perspective into anything that I teach, whether it's the course on leadership, course on ethics, I do intro to management and organizational behavior, right? So I try and pull that in, but then also kind of create in the classroom, create an environment that supports, right? And in, it supports people's dignity, right? So it's not just protecting dignity, but it's promoting dignity, right? So I try to try to think of ways that that makes sense so that students um, can have that experience of what does it feel like to be a student in a classroom where hopefully they feel 
um, appreciated and seen and connected to in, in however I can do that. You know, I'm not saying I'm successful 100% of the time, but I do keep that in, in the back of my mind when I'm putting things together. Um, so I think that's one way, and also trying to create the culture. Um, one of the things I wanna do is revise my syllabi at this point, because it's very contractual looking, you know, like my syllabus looks like, here's what I do, here's what you do kind of thing. But I wanna um, kind of make it less contractual and more, um, here's what we're doing together, kind of. Um, I don't know if that makes sense, but uh, those are things I think about when I'm teaching and pulling that in. Um, I just got kicked off of Zoom. I think I have too many things open here, but I'm sending <laughs> this. Um, hopefully that's helpful. And Elise is wonderful. Thank you very much. What about on the issue of research? You know, because uh, if you look at the internet, you just, you don't have so many journal articles on um, human quality treatments because human quality treatment, humanistic management seem to be the same thing, isn't it? Say that again, Rose, what was the last? You know, we have uh, human quality treatments. Okay. And then humanistic management. Okay. I guess they're the same thing, isn't it? You, th you think they're the same? Yes, I didn't know. They're talking about the same thing. Okay. But what I'm, I find is that, you know, you don't get a lot of uh, um, journal articles right. on human quality treatment. Right. So how people are being treated in, yes. in, in, in organizations. Yes. Mm. Yeah. So one of the things I'm trying to do is, is change my research focus to understanding the experience of people in organizations. So mm. understanding kind of how they you know, how people experience their life in organizations and what does that look like? So those are some, you know, that's like one of my overarching kind of questions, but also centering it on the human experience, right? And, and using dignity and well-being and flourishing as, you know, frameworks and lenses to understand their experience. Um, so I think, and you don't see that very much, right? So if you think of organizational behavior, Right, and how we kind of control, right? How is it that we control people um, and uh, in, in organizational settings, right? That's like a kind of a mindset. And so the mindset really has to change. And I, for me, I think it has to be organizational experience, not behavior, right? Like what are the organization, what are the experiences of people in organizations and how do they support um, dignity and well-being leading to flourishing. So, but yeah, you're right. You know, and the international or the um, humanistic management journal is probably the one place that you can really do well. You know, Jill, there. she's raising her hand. I'm oh, sorry, I'm coming in and out, but yeah. I I wanted to say thank you for saying that, and I've felt it. And in, in my class, um, I mentioned that you know, the very language we use minimizes people because we routinely teach courses on human resources. We have departments and organizations saying human resources, like humans are disposable parts that serve the organization. And that's just so wrong. It should be that the organizations exist to serve us. We come together for a purpose. And then the organization should meet its purpose rather than treat human beings as resources. And in Silicon Valley, where I teach, the language is changing and now they call people talent. And I link it to the story that when assembly line was invented, Ford said, I just need a pair of hands. It's too bad the body comes attached to it. And now that the robots are able to do the hands job, the brain has suddenly become more important. And that's why we are calling them talent and quoting them much more than the way organizations quoted human beings earlier. So language is changing, but I'm not sure if talent captures it well enough, but just mentioning that to the students raises their awareness. 
Right. Yeah, absolutely. And what's interesting, I was just visiting with um, family down in Atlanta and my niece works at um, like a creative uh, development <clears throat> organization and she's uh, an executive assistant to the two C, like there's two CEOs. But one of the things that they focus on is employee experience. Like that's how they talk about. So yes, they talk a little bit about human resources, but the language they use is also about the employee experience. Like how, how are the employees experiencing the changes in, you know, the healthcare, you know, the healthcare insurance that they have and how are they experiencing the work during COVID um, and things like that. So, and so this is obviously a group of probably, you know, 30 somethings. Right, and so they're changing their language in their businesses, I think too, Jyoti, like you said. So not just in Silicon Valley, but I think in a lot of the creative areas, right? Creative areas of work. And I think sometimes it's the more bureaucratic organizations, right? Think about how do we change higher education, right? To become humanistic. How do we create humanistic management within our own departments even? Like, what does that look like? <clears throat> so, yeah, but, and the language is key. I agree. I think the language is key. Oh. PJ, I'm just going to quickly drop into the transforming research room. Okay. And, but just also to let everyone know uh, the reason is because we're doing a PDW on Friday <clears throat> that focuses on how we can actually publish this research that's so meaningful and important to us. And we have an editor's panel. So I just want to make sure that group knows that that's coming as well. So I'll, I'll pop back in. Beautiful. Thanks, Erica. Jyoti, were you here for the entire, have you been here? I was looking yeah. for you. No, I'm just waking up still. <laughs> oh, goodness. Good for you. Yeah, we were working late into the night with um, my colleague in India. RAOM PDW is on Women's Wisdom Circle. Oh, nice. And on Embodied Wisdom and Indigenous Wisdom. And, you know, working with people from around the world has me working at odd hours. So I could not get up at seven in the morning. <laughs> no, no. I, I agree. I agree. Yeah, we had somebody join joining from Australia and she came into our, our small group breakout and um, yeah, she was like, I'm still in bed. I'm like, nope, that's the place to be if, you know, <laughs> you're on the other side of the world for us anyway, like our other side. Yeah, for the session, the people in India will be getting up at four in the morning oh, to do the session. And I had asked if we should ask AOM to reschedule it and they were like, no, since most of the audience is there, we will get up. So I felt obliged that during the prep work, I should be the one getting up to yeah. make it a little bit fairer to spread the pain around. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Yeah, I should find that post with the uh, AOM uh, sessions and repost that now so that it's down where people can see. There's so much in this chat, really. Sorry, when I joined and the discussion was about teaching resources, I shared all the resources I could lay my hands on. Oh, good. No, that's great. People can save the chat window and look at it offline. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. All right. Just wanted to make sure I put that up again. So one of the things, Jyoti, this may be, this is a little off topic. Um, well, not, not really off topic, but one of the things I was thinking about as I was listening to people speak was um, the way, not the way, but 
how, you know, coming from, at least in the US perspective and probably globally as well, but coming from, you know, a sense of uh, privilege, right? So there's, it's, it's easy to say like, oh, surround yourself with creative people or um, surround yourself with, you know, or do things, right? And then ask for forgiveness or things like that. But yet people who are within our, within our US context, right, who are um, marginalized in many ways, you know, to have that ability and power to kind of find their own creativity within a system that is already kind of squashing, right, and really harming their creativity. And even as women, right, even as women, like you said yeah. um, before. So, you know, how do we, I think that's an interesting conversation that we should probably have at some at some point and start, you know, moving that the idea of bringing, you know, what does dignity mean in the context of marginalization as well? Right, right, totally. I agree with you, and you know, as I reviewed back and worked with the colleagues as we prepared for the OOM. That's mm -hmm. when it sunk in for me myself that bringing in the indigenous voices, bringing in the women's voices um, and starting to discover the you know, inbuilt violence in some of the words that are normalized as using and the fact that we still have AOM as only English um, and token words of Japanese management as Kanban or, you know, Korean or Indian management of, you know, Jugaad, that's already telling of what is valued, what is marginalized. So I've, in the prep work, moved more and more into the personal voice. And I think just as we sit down and talk at the humanistic management, events and ask everybody how they are and what's going on. It's like, okay, everybody tell your personal story. Where do you feel marginalized and where do you feel your privilege? And it's remarkable that, you know, people I've looked up to since I was a student also have horror stories of how they were not given the due dignity and respect and were marginalized in certain spaces. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, there's so much work to be done. The most powerful stories were out of a circle where, um, her name is Jay Gooseby Smith. And she runs some circles called Truth. And I'm gonna say reconciliation, but I think her word was something else but it was modeled after Nelson Mandela's truth and reconciliation work after apartheid ended, but in the organizational context. And I was just blown away hearing about that. I haven't experienced one to know what it looks like, mm -hmm. but I, I'm increasingly curious about these things. So yes, I'm totally with you in having those conversations and opening those possibilities, because if not now, when? <laughs> right now right. is the moment it truly is it truly is yeah so one of the um it's one of the organizations i studied in my for my dissertation was dean's beans and back in the 90s they um were working with towns in rwanda and this would have been after the massive genocide hap that happened and, and also the intense sexual violence um, that was a part of that. And so they were bringing, um, they were able to bring in a, you know, a group from a nonprofit to hold like, like a reconciliation. Like how do you, how can you live with your neighbor? right, who was part of the other side that perpetrated a lot of the violence. Um, and they did it, you know, first of all, they did it because it needed to be done. They asked the community 
what do you need, right? So they went in, they asked the community, what is it that you need? And this is what the community said they needed um, to kind of come back together and have a successful coffee farming community. Um, and so, you know, Dean's Beans found the right organization, nonprofit organization, and had them, right, do the workshops and help bring that community back together. And like I said, this was in the 90s. Um, but it's, when you think about things like that, you think, how do you come back together and, um, you know, heal? right, heal and become a flourishing community again. And it doesn't happen overnight and it takes time. Um, so yeah, definitely uh, important, you know, important work, but also important to study that and say, how did this, you know, how did this work and what are the long-term effects um, for that, you know, the idea of reconciliation and what, and what does that look like? I agree with you. I agree with you. So, uh, you know, when we talk about conscious capitalism or fair trade, it already has implication that everything else that is not under that umbrella is unconscious capitalism. How are we going to raise the awareness for that and want our cheap goods without paying the fair prices? Why does just something have to be fair trade? Why not everything be fair? Um, so the need for these organizations and these movements to exist already indicates that the vast majority of things are not that. And that says a lot. That says a lot, too. But yeah. I would love to hear from others in the room if anybody else wants to join the conversation. I have to let my dog out. She's she's like, hey, I need to go out. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Come on, girl. Come on. Hey, you need to go out? Hi, David. EJ, uh, is everyone back? Back. We stepped out to get, uh, let her dog out. Ah, okay. Who let the dogs out? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, woof, 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 woof. <laughs> I am uh, happy to report back a little bit. Is, Mike, is Michael still here? Is Michael Gelb here? Yes. Ah, okay. Did, what uh, are you? I, can you? Oh, there you are on the wait. There you are on the screen. Okay, good. <laughs> so, Michael, did you listen into some of the conversations? What did you What did you hear? And and what would you sort of based on what you hear? What would you recommend us as a group? Uh, to do more of, to, to be more effective healers? Well, our, our group, I was thrilled to be in our group. And what, what I got was just 
it, it's so obvious, but we need to do the research that backs up the notion of the healing organization. There's plenty of research, but we need more. And that's part of telling the story. You know, there's a story that touches your heart, and then there's the story that convinces your analytical mind. And Da Vinci would want us to tell that story from both of those modalities. Uh, and, and, you know, research is just, it's another way of telling a story. One of the most interesting points that came up in our group was the notion of bringing other ways of thinking into how we think, even conceptualize research. Uh, indigenous ways, for example, because there are other ways of validating and confirming and understanding, and we can question our own our own paradigms about what we think validates something, and that was maybe the most powerful thing that I got out of our 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 session was we seem to uh, have a shared notion that the most powerful way to make a difference in the world is to, is to change paradigms. It's to help people think in profoundly new ways. And in our group, we discussed how, you know, the, just the idea of human rights is still a new idea. Uh, a couple hundred years old, really, is the first time it was ever put into a, uh, the founding uh, document of a nation and a lot of growing pains, but that idea is gaining momentum. Uh, and is the hope for humanity. Uh, and, and other great ideas like business can, can lead us to change the world and, and help heal the planet. So these big ideas and, and the ways in which we share these big ideas, whether it's by telling stories, of inspiring stories of people who are manifesting them or by doing research and sharing our research. And also, I just wanna say one other thing, it just, uh, 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 even though I haven't heard directly from some of the wonderful faces I see here on my Zoom screen, uh, I have a, I'm honored to be uh, connected to this community. I have a sense of, of genuine depth of, of care and, and thought. Uh, and uh, community is the other big idea by supporting each other, mm -hmm. coming together, by learning, by sharing. Uh, we can we can make a better world. So thank you. Awesome. And I know Erica put already some of the other events in. What we have been doing with the Humanistic Management Association is attempted to build that community. We want to do more of that. We want to invite you all to be part of that actively and and connect with us here. Uh, Erica, you you are leading a workshop with some of the journal editors tomorrow. You want to talk a little bit about that? Friday. Friday. Uh, yeah, Friday. I think one thirty to three p.m. Uh, Clark had shared earlier, I don't know if that went out to everyone, the link for that, uh, but really the goal there is to think as scholars who do research um, and perhaps have felt a little bit frustrated maybe about how we can do and publish the important impactful research we are doing or want to be doing. Um, we're having an editor's panel um, and Mike will be there representing the Humanistic Management Journal um, all the way through some editors who have been at um, Academy of Management Journal. I think we have uh, Academy of Management Review representative. We've got Business and Society, Business and Society Review, so and several others. Um, but really, to workshops. So well, how do how do we do this um, more than we've been doing it? Um, and so and I think. What Erica, if, correct me if I'm wrong, but we're, we're getting a lot of positive feedback from journal editors re recently, where it's like, this is the kind of stuff that they actually would like to publish on, but but there is sort of a, a, a dichotomy. There is a certain skill in terms of how you speak to that audience. So that's maybe a critical piece that, that's missing. And we wanna develop the capacity internally to, to uh, for, for Michael and others benefit. Those are the top level journals in our field that give the kind of privilege to, to have wider audiences, et cetera, oftentimes. So um, yeah, please uh, join. I think it's Friday afternoon, 1.30, Erica? Yes. Okay, super, wonderful, great. Um, so I wanna share a little bit of what we discussed in the transforming management and how to transform management education. And we had very good ideas. And I think I wanna just shout, shout out to all of the ones in the group. I think everybody here has written books or created materials or shifted their courses. And that's why you're here. So there's so much material. 
Uh, we do have a list that um, PJ, I think you just shared in terms of resources. And I, I think we want to probably add the material, Radha, that you created, Catherine, I think you, you, you might be on there already, or really everybody has something that can be shared. There's also a platform called Ignited uh, dot global that we're working with, which is primarily serving the Jesuit universities, but it can be accessed by anybody which has teaching materials that go in that direction. Uh, there are, I think, 5,000 cases and, and other material on there that you can check out. Uh, but we want to build that out. And then what I what I got from the conversation also, of course, I, I there's this material. We can change the classes, and many of us are doing that. And that's fantastic. We want to potentially create a support group for how to can how how we can learn from each other more uh, in various domains. Um, a, a number of people were mentioning to the scale how to scale it is through interdepartmental connection. Uh, I think Rajiv shared how in India the national policy is being shifted, so that's great, of course, if that can happen, and how to integrate the humanities more and shift away from a functional focus to a problem-oriented focus. So that requires more interdisciplinary teaching. Um, it'd be curious to, I'd be curious, and I think many of us would be curious to see how that actually works, how well it works, um, and what are the consequences, uh, because much of our institutions are rooted in the functional <laughs> uh, logic. Um, so that, but that is one thing, and I think in some colleges, Christine was sharing that they are able to more easily uh, work across departments and then through grant money, actually, or grants, uh, create focal points that are dignity related, where they can then uh, create more partnerships across departments. Um, and so that that is an, is another piece. I, I think Anke was talking about working with industry together. So if we work with industry, like the the the, the likes of the companies that Michael was sharing in his book, the Healing Organization, but also like Bob Chapman, those folks they're they're open to working with us in many ways, right? So how can we amplify that is is the question. But involving that could be also attractive to our students, with the intention that it's not just research that we are giving people or a sort of lecture style, but that we're allowing them to engage in real life practice. And then of course the question of methodology came up: How do we teach? Who are we to teach and 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 who what's our being when we teach are we those beacons of dignity uh, when we teach and of course oftentimes i would say we fail at that <laughs> uh possibly and 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 that's okay uh and we can we can do better and we can go on and we can sort of create that space of how we can be better around that um did i miss anything from the group who did anyone want to come in elton did you feel represented okay yeah, awesome. i think you have covered everything uh, very well just one point to add uh, uh, that industry academia linkages you know they promote a lot of uh, work particularly in mba institutions because students want to work with industry and uh, in india we have uh, uh, legislation whereby every company is required to keep two percent of the profit after tax for CSR okay. activities or sustainability activities. So industry is looking for people who work in this area and the students are looking for placement and internship. So it works very well. And industry academia linkages, you know, particularly in management education could be a good way to take it mm -hmm. forward where they can work on community and sustainability and industry. Great. So that's a great entry point and maybe other countries have other entry points where that can be done. Um, so we want to be there and, and support that. And so please reach out. We're at the end of our pre-conference. I thank you all for joining, for staying so long and for being so engaged. And thank you all for the work that you're doing. Um, PJ, do you want to say some last words? Just really thank you everybody for your being here today because really the community is the key, right? The community and the support we have for each other is really, I think, what we need to keep moving forward and keep growing and the ideas come from everywhere and it's just it's beautiful so thank you all for being here and, and bringing your energy and your spirit and let's all thank and unmute and thank michael for his time and for sharing his wisdom with us so thank you michael thank you <laughs>
and hopefully to more and we want to do some more workshops that are more targeted also and if you have specific ideas for lunch and learns or for other kinds of workshops please send them to pj send them to me send them to erica send them to ariane send them to jennifer if she's still on all right thank you all have a great thank rest you of have a great academy good so, so. thank you very much please enjoy your academy thank you and same to you thank you all Bye. thanks see you soon thanks Corley. no thank you guys pj do you want to debrief quickly yeah we can absolutely i'll just say goodbye michael we do yeah. want to get in touch with you one of these days yes we'll yes yes i i'm pretty okay. busy until the end of <laughs> absolutely uh, the next 10 days and then then i have more space good michael good luck on the uh, academy of management thanks thank you Bye. thank you Ta -ta. pj do you want to ping uh, erica if she can uh join yeah let me see i can text her real quick was there was anybody else there ariane i think ariane was there um and jen, was she the end? jen had to leave i know okay. she had to leave so all right well, why don't we just sort of close this room and then come back in okay okay sounds good bye everyone bye